governments all over the world officially deny the existence of UFOs. I was called upon to investigate a very strange event. A thick cloak of secrecy has been drawn over most encounters, especially when it appears that an unidentified craft has apparently compromised national security. Nothing in my training prepared me for what I was witnessing. But some cases have proved too big and too well documented to cover up, as in the case that's become known as Britain's Roswell. There was a bright light emanating from an object on the forest floor. Two strange encounters of the same mysterious lights on two consecutive nights in 1980. There's something very, very strange. Send American Air Force troops in Britain scrambling to find out if they're under attack. We've taken a whole new look with new witnesses. We've suddenly reopened this entire case. What made highly trained, no-nonsense military men? It was my intention to go out there and just put it all to rest. Believe they may have been in contact with a UFO. Is that real? The team from UFO Magazine analyzed newly discovered evidence using the latest technology. Take away point! And reached some controversial new conclusions. I think it's safe to say, yeah. For the first time on television, definitive answers about whether U.S. forces actually witnessed UFO landings at Bentwaters Air Force Base in December of 1980. This is case number 80101, Military versus UFOs. There were multiple witnesses, and an object was seen to land in a place called Rendlesham Forest. Is that awesome or what? Bill and Pat have recently returned from the National Press Club Conference on Disclosure in Washington, D.C., where one alleged UFO sighting stood out because it was witnessed by numerous military officials. I think the most impressive thing about this National Press Club Conference on Disclosure was all the evidence around the Rendlesham landing. Britain's best-known UFO sighting occurred in 1980 and involved United States Air Force personnel from two military bases in the UK. This UFO was seen on two separate consecutive evenings, and that just doesn't happen in UFO cases. And, and this is in 1980. Remember what was going on in 1980, that the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, we were nervous about what was going on over in Eastern Europe, so the world was on a knife edge with nuclear weapons. And so at that point, that's when this object appears over Aria Bentwaters, the most secure U.S. military base. They must have some sort of official explanation for that's that. Right. What the skeptics believe is that there was a lighthouse in the distance. The lighthouse was maybe flashing in the distance, and these soldiers were somehow confused by the lighthouse, and they thought it was a UFO. I don't believe it, Pat. That's not right. These are hard-trained individuals. How would they think it's a lighthouse? I mean, it makes sense. I hear you, Jeff, but that's what the experts have been saying for the past 27 years. Sounds like an interesting theory. You know, guys, we can model that out. We can do our own experiments. We can take GPS coordinates of the various sighting positions and this lighthouse. We could get the topographic maps. We could build a model and see if that hypothesis holds water. This is going to be fantastic because we will either prove it was a lighthouse, that it could have been a lighthouse, or not. Either way, this will be a phenomenal piece of proof as to whether that theory holds up. Let's see if it does. So we're going to Reynoldson? Get your passports. Nice. The team travels to RAF Bentwaters, a US Air Force base in England, located approximately 85 miles northeast of London and adjacent to Rendlesham Forest. Nick, tell us about the famous Rendlesham incident. Nick Pope joined the Ministry of Defense in 1985. Between 1991 and 1994, my job was to investigate UFO sightings for the government to see whether there was evidence of anything of any defense significance. The UK's Ministry of Defense has investigated UFO cases dating back to 1967. But UFO military encounters across the world date back even further. 1948, United States. Captain Mantell of the Kentucky Air National Guard chases a reported UFO 
Minutes later, he is killed when his jet crashes. 1956, England. Radar operators at RAF Lakenheath track multiple unidentified objects traveling at speeds of up to 12,000 miles per hour. Now, Project Blue Book, the United States uh, research effort, described this as arguably one of the best radar visual cases in the files. According to Project Blue Book, the object outmaneuvers a Venom NF-3 jet interceptor. Pilots report seeing glowing lights seemingly under intelligent control. The incident was investigated at the time, but once the air traffic controllers had been interviewed, the pilots had been interviewed, the statements taken, really, this ended up just as unknown. 1989, Belgium. Beerset Air Force Base detects something on radar. 19 police officers spot the craft. One of the witnesses records it on video. The triangular object reportedly pulses with three powerful searchlights. Witnesses report the object seems to be noiseless, except for a soft hum. Two and a half hours later, it disappears. Four months later, it returns. Colonel Wilfred Brewer of the Belgian Air Force scrambles two F-16 interceptors. La station radar a été contactée plusieurs fois pour demander s'ils avaient des observations au radar. When the F-16s lock onto the craft, it moves erratically with an acceleration of 46 Gs, far more than the human body can withstand. The object disappears. If all these cases involving pilots seeing UFOs, tracking them on radar, could be viewed from end to end, I think it would make a compelling case for the reality of the UFO phenomenon. Because when you have that combination of the professional, the reliable observer, and the evidence from radar backing up that testimony, you are making a, a very, very compelling case. It's easy to associate UFOs with a fringe element, but once you get up to this whole military chapter of UFOs, it's a whole new ball game. During his service with England's Ministry of Defense, Nick Polk investigated between 200 and 300 new reports of UFOs each year, making him one of the most experienced UFO investigators in the country. I think that one of the most important UFO sightings of all time is the Rendlesham Forest incident which occurred right here on the scale of UFO cases is, is right up there in terms of its significance and in terms of the evidence. I mean, this has sometimes been called Britain's Roswell. December 26th, 1980, midnight. Security police at RAF Woodbridge a British Air Force base located next to RAF Bentwaters, report seeing an unknown light in Rendlesham Forest. At first, they believe it's a downed aircraft. Later, they realize it might possibly be something else. Sergeant Jim Penniston and two other officers investigate the site. When we arrived to inspect the crash site, it quickly became apparent that we were not dealing with a plane crash or anything else we've ever responded to. There was a bright light emulating from an object on the forest floor. Penniston and his team approached the object on foot, taking notes along the way. A silhouette triangular craft about nine feet long, six and a half feet high, came into view. Penniston alleges that the craft had blue and yellow lights swirling around its surface. We started experiencing radio difficulties. The air around us was electrically charged, and we could feel it on our clothes, our skin, and our hair. Penniston claims the surface of the craft had inscribed symbols three inches high and two and a half feet long. The largest symbol was a triangle centered in the middle. As Penniston gets closer to the object, he says that he touched it. Even though it looked like black onyx, it felt like metal. 45 minutes later, the object maneuvers through the forest and takes off lifted up off the ground and shot away at uh, an incredible speed. It was gone in a blink of an eye. Over 80 Air Force personnel witnessed the takeoff. It wasn't a helicopter. There is no way that you could have gotten any 
conventional aircraft in there. There's no way you would have got a helicopter in there. And the, the other point, of course, is these are people who worked at an Air Force base. And they said this was like nothing we'd ever seen before. I feel like I've stepped into the eye of the, the UFO hurricane. Here was an experienced Air Force officer that experienced something out of this world. Now, this UFO was triangular in shape. It was about nine feet wide and six feet high. Jim Peniston got close enough to touch the side of this thing, and he saw strange symbols on the hull. Peniston transcribed six symbols etched in the craft's surface. Most of the symbols are composed of straight lines and symmetrical. People have been trying to decipher that writing for years, thinking maybe it's Egyptian, maybe it's hieroglyphic, maybe it's pictographs. Clearly, there was a message there that we still haven't deciphered to this very day. Some witnesses claim that the UFO left physical evidence behind. There were indentations in the ground where this thing had landed. Okay, we're now approaching Erie within about 25, 30 feet. Hey, this is Erie. This is strange. Erie, tell me one look at the spots on the ground. Bear in mind, of course, this is the middle of winter. The ground was very hard. Those indentations had to have been made by something that weighed several tons. And there were three of these indentations. Plaster casts were made of the indentations. When plotted, they allegedly formed an equilateral triangle. It was almost as if this craft had come down on a landing strut, so some sort of tripod-like device. There was no conventional aircraft in 1980 known to have a triangular-shaped landing pad that was equilateral. On the following night, five soldiers led by Colonel Charles Halt investigate the site. They discover what they feel to be indisputable evidence of anomalous activity. But it had left physical trace evidence. And witness an alarming event. It was back. December 26th, 1980, midnight. 80 U.S. Air Force personnel allegedly witness an unknown bright object land in Rendlesham Forest, England. Not just had this UFO been seen by these trained, reliable military witnesses, but it had left physical trace evidence. It had left indentations in the ground where it had come down. On the following night, a squad of soldiers surveys the area with a Geiger counter and detect abnormally high traces of radiation. What kind of readings are we getting? Anything? Seven tenths here. Seven tenths right there in the center? Uh -huh. The most significant development in terms of the evidence was that they recorded levels which peaked, critically, they peaked in those three holes where the thing had come to rest. The Ministry of Defense released 38 pages of documents relating to the Rendlesham sighting. Most of the file is correspondence to and from residents curious about the reported event. But one interdepartmental memo contains a chilling sentence. Our defense intelligence staff subsequently assessed the levels of radiation as, quote, significantly higher than background, unquote. It is absolutely official. It's there in black and white in a Ministry of Defense document written by their scientific and technical intelligence specialists, yes. Unlike many UFO stories, this can be backed up. There's an audit trail of verifiable documents bearing out the very things that we've been speaking about. Nick Pope gave us uh, information about documentation that we didn't even know existed. And uh, that makes it all the more valid to me. It's really taken this investigation to a whole new level for me. Experts believe that some military bases around the world have long secret histories of UFO encounters. There are many hundreds of cases of encounters between military aircraft and UFOs. The team tries to find an explanation for these disturbing sightings. 
and I'm, I'm going over some of these archival materials here, and I'm finding out that there's a pretty strong correlation between military and UFO sightings. In July 1945, we actually detonated our first atomic bomb test. And two years later, also in July, we have the Roswell crash. And the Roswell crash is what, 100 miles away from Alamogordo? Ever since 1947, there has been a correlation between possible UFO sightings and the testing, manufacturing, and storage of nuclear weapons. Is it only a coincidence that Roswell is barely 100 miles from Trinity, New Mexico, the site of the world's first nuclear explosion? And here's this case in Pasco, Washington, 1945. Uh, a UFO was caught on radar at a naval air station. It was flying over Hanford Engineering Works, which was a major manufacturer of plutonium. That's right, and Hanford later became a major nuclear power facility, so the nuclear power industry has stayed there really for over 60 years. In 1945, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee experienced numerous UFO sightings. We now know the lab was a top secret atomic bomb plant. In 1965, Edwards Air Force Base in California spotted 12 luminous UFOs on radar. This is the power in Edwards. We have an object now. We have some confirmed reports of unidentified flying objects here, area. Unidentified flying saucers? They have been confirmed on radar. F-106 interceptors made visual contact. I have another red light moving very rapidly. He's flashing white and green. Definitely is an aircraft. The F-106 jets carried Genie nuclear-tipped rockets with its weaponry. Did this nuclear technology trigger a UFO visit? If there's a link between UFOs and nuclear weapons, I mean, what do you think is going on? Are they spying on the technology? Are they interested in nuclear technology? Or maybe they're trying to uh, prevent nuclear technology? I think they are monitoring us. I think they are spying on us. But the big point is this, that every time you see UFOs, that are invading the airspace over nuclear weapons facilities that are highly sensitive military installations, they don't even bother to be stealthy because they are entering our airspaces with such impunity over these nuclear weapon sites, they don't even care if they're being seen or not. Strange to be back here. This was the hot row here where weapons were stored in the ATF fire team facility down there. Colonel Halt served as deputy base commander at Bentwaters during the UFO sighting at Rendlesham Forest. He will neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons on the base. You have to imagine, he's the guy who was sitting with his finger on a nuclear button, even though we can't say it, because you can't talk about American nuclear weapons on UK soil. A key security component of the base is the watchtower, located just to the north of the hot row. It provides a view of the entire area and the Rendlesham Forest site. The team meets Gary Heseltine, a former Air Force policeman with experience in securing nuclear sites. I've long been fascinated by the Rendlesham Forest case because between 1983 and 1989, I served in the Royal Air Force as a police officer. And on two nuclear facilities, you always had a high tower. The significance of the tower was that it was above the tree line and it had a 360 view. Colonel, this is unbelievable. What a view. You can see everything from up here. Yeah, one thing you have to keep in mind, the trees are much higher now. We had a 360 panorama from up here before. <clears throat> we would never let the trees grow this high for security reasons. And from here, the tower operator had a fantastic view of everything for miles around. So if somebody were up here, he could see everything that was going on over in that area that night, on both nights. But with somebody up here, this type of tower would have to be manned 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So, Colonel, I'm telling, I, I suspect that there was somebody up here. Have you any knowledge of anybody up here? On oh, yes. In fact, I know who was up here very well. In November 2007, Colonel Halt received an email from one of the guards who was posted in the observation tower that night in 1980. He has given me quite a bit of correspondence, and he verifies the fact that that night when he was in the tower, he actually saw beams coming down into the weapons storage area simultaneous to the one we saw over our feet in the field. Did you say there was a man up here who, who also saw the incident from here, and he saw beams coming down? 
So this is a whole new witness to this entire case. Well, he doesn't really want to come forward. If a person were up here, as you've said, and could see the whole thing, including the lighthouse and the events on the ground and the forest. We're talking about a genuine object it's firing beams down into a special facility, a highly secret, secure area. So we have a whole new witness. This breaks this case wide open again. Another piece of evidence also corroborates the alleged UFO incident. On the following night, December 26, 1980, Colonel Halt documented his encounter on a cassette recorder. It recreates his experience moment by moment and has become one of the most compelling documents in UFO history. The team retraces the steps of Colonel Halt's UFO encounter that night. This is the infamous East Gate at Woodbridge. This is where the event actually started. Colonel Halt arrived at the site with five servicemen after being told by the other police officers that the mysterious light had been spotted a second time. The police claimed that it was back. They kept telling me it was back. When you heard this report from these men, what did you make of it? What was your frame of mind? I thought there was a rational explanation for this. I guess I was a non-believer is the best way to put it. What happened when you came out to investigate? Somebody had to go out and respond and put this to rest. And it was my intention to go out there and just put it all to rest and put it all behind us and get it over with. And that's really what I intended to do and what I expected to do. In fact, you know, when I got out there, I thought, why did I ever get involved in this? I wish I had done this. I wish I'd let somebody else do this because nobody will believe this. So. I gathered up a small team, five people, and we went out into the forest. You just saw a light yes, there. Where? There it is again. Yeah, it's a strange red light. So here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Colonel Charles Halt, an American serviceman stationed in Britain in 1980, recounts the night he chased down what he believes was a UFO. Did you do anything to document the sighting on the night? Yes, I actually have my little in-ear portable tape recorder with me, so I turned it off and on. As something was occurring, I documented everything on the tape. It's a strange red light. There's something very, very strange. And it just moved to the right. Yeah. Off to the right. Strange. Halt claims that he led a team of soldiers from the east gate of RAF Bentwaters. They then spotted the bright object in Rendlesham Forest and reportedly chased after it, heading east. When they reached a farmhouse in a clearing, the object launched into the skies. We were moving this, in this direction, as was the object I saw moving through the trees. Okay, we're looking at the thing we're probably about two to 300 yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you, still moving from side to side. It, it sort of has a hollow center. Halt reports that the light moved past a creek into a nearby field. We just crossed the, the creek. We see strange uh, stroke like flashes to the uh, rather sporadic, but there's definitely something, uh, some kind of phenomenon. We come out of the forest up here about another 100 yards, chasing the object. The object came out in the middle of this field. The field contained a farmhouse, cattle, and at that time, a bright moving object. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers burning our animals. It's very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. So here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. And we're looking out this way, obviously. OK. There's the farmer's house. Yeah. The object was out here in the field, over here. Mm -hmm. Right. The lighthouse is over there, about 30 degrees. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. So once you got out here to the field, the object was gone? The object silently exploded into five white objects, and they just disappear. Is there any way this could have been some sort of flare? Flare I mean, doesn't move through the forest, avoiding trees, and bob up and down a little bit. It came toward us at some point. It went away from us at some point. And when we approached it, it moved out here into the field. Now, what exactly were you seeing? It's an object that was oval-shaped, bright reddish-orange, almost like the sun at midday. It had a black oval center. It would blow, like wink a little bit, and it was dripping something like molten metal. 
It was molten metal? Well, I say that's the only way I can equate it. It was something was dripping that appeared off it. So helicopter explanation is out? No, it wasn't a helicopter. Colonel Halt is one of the most credible eyewitnesses that I've ever had the chance to talk to. This man ran an entire military base with a lot of top secret weapons that he couldn't tell me about. And I don't think he made a mistake that night. I think something happened that people weren't meant to know about. These two bases adjacent to the forest were among the most secure in the world. Impenetrable fences encircled the bases, razor wire, motion detectors, embedded sensors, and more than 25 heavily armed patrolmen guard the facilities. This was a facility with some of the tightest security in the world. And this thing comes out of the sky, it lands there not once, but twice in a 24 hour period without triggering any sort of alarm. The only way that this thing was seen was by the human eye when these guards came out to see it. And what's odd is that this thing was brilliantly lit. It shone beams down to the ground. It's almost as if it didn't even care if it was seen or not. It's almost as though it could care less about how we would defend ourselves against it. There's nothing we had that this thing was scared of. And for me, that's the scariest thing of all. RAF Bentwaters most likely housed nuclear weapons as tensions grew in the 1980s. You have to remember what the world was like in 1980. Some historians call it the start of the Second Cold War, a Cold War threatening to become a hot war, with two sides staring at each other across the Iron Curtain. And Ronald Reagan had just been elected president and was making all kinds of threats against the evil empire of the Soviet Union. It was a very scary time with both sides making all kinds of military threats. I'm not saying the aliens were actually listening to us, but if they were, they might have thought we were just days away from pushing the button. And here, a UFO came over, a nuclear weapons base was beaming shots of light down on nuclear weapons. I guess maybe scanning the weapons. It interfered with the base operations, interfered with the radios. They scrambled the security team. The UFO actually lured the security team off the base. So the Americans freak out. They shut it down. They do nothing. They don't want to talk about it. The United States hasn't investigated UFOs since Project Blue Book ended in January 1970. But to this day, Britain's Ministry of Defense does, as unidentified objects might pose a threat to British security. Strangely, Colonel Halt, an American, was not interviewed or debriefed by British authorities. There was nothing like this had ever happened before. All previous UFO sightings were just lights in the sky, really. The Americans kind of hope that the British will deal with it, and the British hope that it's an American problem, and that if anyone says nothing, hopefully the whole situation will go away. British and American authorities simply advised Halt to send a memo to the UK's Ministry of Defense about the events in the forest. But two days prior to Colonel Halt's submission of his memo, another inexplicable event occurred, an event that left local resident and forester Vincent Thurkettle puzzled and disturbed. I lived in a cottage just over there. I was out chopping wood. Thurkettle lived and worked in Rendlesham Forest at the time of the sighting. Between Christmas and New Year, a car pulled up. Two young Englishmen got out, say 25 years old, in suits, came and talked to me. And what they were asking was, they said, we've heard of red lights being seen in the forest. Who were these mysterious men? And how did they know of the UFO event before Colonel Halt released the information? It sounds to me like uh, Vincent was actually visited. The team uncovers some alarming answers. A few days after the UFO incident, two strange men interrogated the residents of Rendlesham Forest in Britain. No one knows who they were or what they wanted. A car pulled up, two young Englishmen got out, say 25 years old, in suits, came and talked to me. And what they were asking was, they said, we've heard of red lights being seen in the forest. And were you out last night? I said, no. They said, did you see anything? Do you, do you know anyone? And I said, no. And then they just closed the conversation down and went. 
What's really exciting is this new information about Vincent Thurkettle being visited by some kind of men in black. He did mention that two Englishmen in black suits in a black car visited him. It almost sounds like a cliche, but it sounds to me like uh, Vincent was, was actually visited by the men in black. UFO researchers recognize Thurkettle's encounter as a classic men in black scenario. Frequently, after a UFO sighting, Witnesses are reportedly visited by two men who question them about what they saw. Two young British guys interviewed me and I later found out they interviewed everyone in the area to check if we were out that night and if we'd seen anything. Who do you think they were? Were they journalists? Were they Well, they, if military? they were journalists, they never published. And what's fascinating about that is Colonel Hart hadn't even written his letter. The letter that blew everything up and supposedly informed the British about it uh, he hadn't written that letter. This case has been investigated for decades, right? And this is the first time I've heard anything about this men in black. This is a huge piece of the puzzle we're talking about here. So I need to go talk to Colonel Halt about this. I have a feeling he might be able to tell us a little bit more about it. Vincent told me that he was visited by two young men in black suits who questioned him about the incident. But the thing is, how would they know about it as your memo hadn't been released yet? I don't know who they were. It was done discreetly, I know that. I do know that the airmen involved were questioned under very mysterious circumstances by people that they didn't recognize, and some of them were British. It's a really big deal. As a Department of Forestry employee, Vincent Thurkettle is an expert on the Rendlesham Forest area and feels that Halt's sighting of a UFO was no sighting at all. This guy knows that for us, and he's trying to tell me that he really didn't find anything unusual in the area where the UFO supposedly landed. His argument is convincing that maybe it was the lighthouse. Six miles away from the reported UFO landing site sits Orford Ness Lighthouse. Skeptics claim that its 3,000-watt beam of light is what the servicemen mistook for the UFO. It's like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. And the flash is so bright it, uh, it almost burns your eye. If we don't believe they were looking at the lighthouse, then we have to believe that they were watching a UFO which was pulsing at the same interval as the lighthouse and was, you know, less bright than the lighthouse. And yet on Colonel Holt's tape, he makes no mention of it. Now, Vincent also said that the duration of the strobe on the lighthouse was every five seconds, and it seemed to coincide with you making entries on your tape recorder every five seconds. Is that a coincidence? Let me show you something. I have the tape recorder here with me. It's a small linear. The tapes are 20 minutes in duration. So there's no way I could have kept the tape running the whole time. I must have stopped that tape 100 times. And it's very simple to do. If you look, there's just a simple slide switch. I was going click, 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 click the whole time we were out there because I didn't want to run out of tape. Well, there it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Looks the uh, maybe a quarter to half mile, maybe further out. Six weeks later, Thurkettle inspected the three indentations the UFO supposedly made in the field. So I'm going through the woods now, hearts going, really excited, and then we got to an area where there was a ring of sticks over a glade in the sort of bracken, this brown dead stuff around us, and um, he said, this is it. And as I looked at it, I said, but these, are, these are rabbit scrapes. Now, Vincent also had something to say about the indentations in the ground. He's of the opinion that they were rabbit scrapings. Keep in mind, a day or two after the incident, someone in the security police squad, and I'm sure, went out there and created at least one, if not two, false sites, and they put a lot of sticks in the ground around it. Why would someone do that? Uh, to mislead people, perhaps? I don't know. So maybe Vincent was looking at the wrong site. I don't know what he looked at, but he said it was six weeks later when he went out. Why would someone like Vincent, basically someone who wasn't there, get so much credence for his theories? You know, it's not uncommon for black programs, as I like to call them, to use disinformation as a very efficient tool and a very good way to discredit a story. Just days before any reports went to the U.S. Air Force about the event at Bent Waters, British intelligence agents show up and start interviewing people. What were they doing? The British must have known, at some level of the government, what was going on and what they had to do to cover this up. At first, I thought, OK, maybe it could have been a lighthouse. But I'm really starting to believe that Colonel Hall did have a huge experience. Conflicting testimony from highly credible witnesses 
have kept the debate about the lighthouse theory alive for more than 27 years. But can the testimony stand up to the scrutiny of scientific proof? I'm looking forward to getting more detail of where his position was, the position of this UFO, where it landed, and the position and orientation of the farmhouse. The most widely accepted explanation is that the lighthouse emitted a beam of light that reflected off the farmhouse and created the mysterious light the soldiers saw. The team decides to test this theory. Well, I thought what we want to do is get the best coordinates we can. I know it's been 27 years, but we'll just do the best we can. So Jeff and I will stay out here with the GPS, and if you two can go back to the site where you thought you were that night and, and, and then adjust our positions based on your sight lines from that location. Using the GPS coordinates of the main landmarks, the team will construct a 3D model of the event. Oh, is this the kind of where they were? Actually, a little more to the right. Ted, a little bit this way. Further forward. OK. That's good. As best I can determine. Make a waypoint. Ted marks the GPS coordinates of where Colonel Halt said the UFO landed. That's good. Colonel Halt points out the location of the lighthouse. Right? There's a notch in the far tree line over there. It was about 30 degrees from where the, I saw the object to where the lighthouse was. That was my recollection. OK, so if Jeff is the light source, is that good? Yeah. Take a waypoint. OK, Ted, come on back here. We'll plug the GPS into the camera, and we'll shoot from this waypoint. Was the object witnessed by more than 80 Air Force servicemen and the deputy base commander merely a beam of light? a UFO, or something else entirely. Is it possible that the beam from that light was what the troops in the forest saw? Science may hold the answer. And a new expert witness, never before interviewed, speaks out. The lighthouse is actually Experiments producer John Tyndall has created a model of Rendlesham Forest to determine what the military officers witnessed. Was it a beam of light or a UFO? Well, remember we were in Rendlesham Forest in England. We took GPS coordinates and photographs as well. Mm -hmm. This was the, the view from where Colonel Halt was, was standing that night. And with that and the photographs, we've been able to recreate to scale exactly what was happening there. And we, what we want to do is, is prove and or disprove two different points. The first point is, can a, a lighthouse six miles in the distance have any sort of effect on, on the face of that farmhouse? Second, can the UFO have an effect on the face of that building? What the colonel was saying was he was actually seeing reflections coming back from the windows. Mm -hmm. So in that miniature, we put some uh, a little dental mirrors in there, actually, to, uh, to uh, aid us in, in doing the reflection. Never before has somebody actually geometrically set up the angles of sight between the lighthouse, the farmhouse, the clearing, and the forest. So where was Colonel Holt's line of sight now? Right over here. So this is the position where he was standing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've set this up as a line of sight so we can get the exact angle to the lighthouse or the windows in the house. I see it. Uh, Jeff, why don't you bring the uh, magic UFO wand in, and we're going to approximate it in that area. That position where Jeff has that light is where Colonel Halt said this UFO had landed. I can see the reflection in the window from his point of view. And what's interesting is that the lighthouse is a separate light entirely not reflecting in the window. Because there is no reflection from the lighthouse to this, into this line of sight. You see the light directly, but you don't see any reflection. But I don't understand how the lighthouse even plays into this. Uh, oh, that's, that's a very good point. The, the lighthouse is almost over the horizon, and it's just, it's just a very strange idea that experienced servicemen would get excited about a lighthouse in the distance. There it is again. Yeah, it's a strange red light. There's definitely something there, some kind of phenomenon. The second experiment was, where must there have been a light source in order to create a reflection 
off the windows of the house and into Colonel Holt's eyes. I'm seeing a reflection on the window from uh, the object that's supposed to be the UFO. So a bright light reflecting off the UFO from that position would definitely make the house look that it was on fire, as if it were on fire right, that's behind what it the window. Sorry, like the pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. And the flash is so bright it, uh, it almost burns your eye. I think it's safe to say that if there was a very bright light in the position that Colonel Halt observed there to be, the angle of reflection off of the house is just about optimal off those windows to get the brightest reflection back to the observation. I think basically we've just closed the door about Orford Ness being the source of the light that Charles Holt saw that night, whether it's a UFO, whether it's not a UFO, who knows what it is. One person may be able to provide a definitive answer to this UFO debate. Keith Seaman is the keeper of the Orford Ness Lighthouse. Is it possible that the beam from that light was what the troops in the forest saw that night on December 26, 1980? If we look at the lighthouse behind us, we can see that it's got a big piece of metal behind it, pointing in the direction of Rendlesham, which is over there. Now, albeit that the intensity of the light was greater then, in 1980, than it is now, the light still wouldn't have shone actually directly through the trees. All you would see on a clear night is the flash of the lighthouse every five seconds going across the sky. So you're saying that that cover, that piece of metal that is blocking the light was there in 1980? It's always been there. So there's never been a time in the history of this lighthouse that the light was actually shining towards Reynoldsham no. Forest? No. I think we finally got a whole new piece to the puzzle. According to Keith Siemens, a lighthouse attendant, there's a big piece of metal on the backside of the lighthouse that doesn't shine towards land, it shines out to sea. So this is like a huge, exciting new piece of information that, that no one's really ever looked into. And thankfully, we actually came here to get the information to find out for ourselves. We interviewed Charles Holt and confirmed the entire story that Colonel Holt said. We actually went to the tower, brand new spot, where a witness whom we discovered saw the entire event play out from the vantage point of the tower and could see everything. We've interviewed other witnesses, and every single story was credible. All these eyewitnesses have stood by their testimony for over 30 years now. And we've completely disproven this whole lighthouse theory. Yeah, but guys, it's not like just by disproving the lighthouse theory, we've proven the existence of UFOs. I mean, there still could be other explanations. You know, we know there are two top secret Air Force bases in the area. It could have been uh, some sort of new top secret military aircraft or a drone or something. I just don't want to jump to the conclusion that it was. It has to have been extraterrestrial UFO vehicles. True. I mean, what, what if it were some kind of drone? But maybe it wasn't ours. You know, that would explain all the disinformation around the topic, right? The government's denial that anything of significance happened there. And I would give you that without hesitation, except for one thing in my mind that still sticks: drones, at least the ones that I know don't float out into a field and then split into five separate lights and go in five separate directions. That bothers me. Well, it could okay? still be some kind of top secret drone, right? Look, we've really done a great job in this case. I think we've really closed it up. We've sent the skeptics running. As you say, we've shown it could not possibly have been their favorite theories. So you know what? We've debunked the debunkers. The Rendlesham Forest case differs from other reported sightings because of the number of witnesses. Over 80 witnessed the takeoff. The level of their expertise. The deputy base commander is telling me that he had a UFO event. And the physical evidence left behind. We discovered radiation. But like most UFO cases, there may be an earthly explanation for the events of those two nights in 1980. Did the troops really encounter a UFO? Is it possible that nuclear bases are being monitored by something not of this world? I'm firmly convinced that what we saw was something out of the ordinary. The answer to why a UFO presence might persist here and elsewhere is as mysterious as the UFOs themselves. There's something very, very strange. In the 1950s, 
following the incident at Roswell, New Mexico, a wave of people around the world came forward claiming to have made contact with extraterrestrial beings. Some claimed to have seen them up close, others claimed to have been taken aboard craft, and others even claimed a complete dialogue with their alien counterparts. Most of these claims were dismissed as hoaxes, and the rest remained unproven until now. Two men have come forward 500 miles apart with documented video evidence of repeated close encounters. You're gonna see, I'm gonna flip the camera right now, infrared. I've never seen anything like that. Both are seeing strange spheres, lights, and orbs. I drive up to this orb, the orb becomes two orbs. Both are feeling communication. I truly believe that's what all this is leading to, a meeting with a biological entity. Could they share the same medical anomaly? There is an abnormality here. For the first time on national television, will their shocking video footage and medical test results finally provide solid evidence that alien contact has occurred? I've had contact my whole life. This is case number 58105, Alien Contact. On September 5, 1977, the Voyager 1 spacecraft left Earth carrying state-of-the-art scientific instruments on its journey towards Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. But the craft was also carrying something else, a 12-inch gold-plated copper disk. The disk was encoded with 115 images, greetings in 55 languages, natural sounds of weather, animals, and the ocean, all hand-picked by Carl Sagan and fellow astronomers. According to NASA, this golden record was designed, quote, to carry a greeting to any form of life should that be encountered. The disk was inscribed with visual instructions on how to play the record and decode the images, and also with a pulsar map that defined the location of our sun through a mathematical code. After 30 years, the data captured by Voyager 1 continues to be transmitted to Earth. But in its more than 9 billion miles of exploration, Voyager hasn't encountered extraterrestrial contact, as far as we know. As Voyager continues its journey into deep space, human attempts to contact an alien race have only become more advanced. Ever since 1961, leading astronomers and scientists around the world have engaged in a program called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The mission of SETI is, quote, to explore, understand, and explain the origin, nature, and prevalence of life in the universe. One of its primary facilities is the Allen Telescope Array in Hat Creek, California, 290 miles northeast of San Francisco. The Allen Array is a collection of radio telescopes designed in part to survey thousands of stars for possible broadcast and electronic contact from deep space. The team begins their investigation into alien contact at the array with senior astronomer Seth Shostak. The idea is that all these little antennas, when connected together, can actually operate like one big one. It's in fact just a big metal ear that we can aim at nearby stars and hope to pick up something. Everything that we found out about the universe in the past 20, 30, 40 years has all pointed in one direction, namely that what's happened on this planet may not be a miracle. You're saying that the universe could be filled with life. It's looking more and more optimistic all the time. I mean, the chances seem pretty good. But in order to authenticate any legitimate signal, SETI must first sift through the congested traffic of signals that originate from Earth. Government and telecommunications satellites must be ruled out, radar from local airplanes and airports disqualified, and other man-made interference like radio and TV signals discounted. The process sometimes produces what SETI scientists refer to as false alarms, signals that at first appear to have an extraterrestrial source. One of SETI's most controversial alarms was the WOW signal detected on August 15, 1977, 
at the SETI project at Ohio State University. The signal was seen on a computer printout by Dr. Jerry R. Amon, who circled it and wrote, wow. He was amazed that the data closely resembled what they thought an alien signal might look like. The strong signal lasted for 72 seconds, and it seemed to have further characteristics that were not consistent with earthly or solar system origins. Within about a minute after that first signal was detected, a second receiver on that antenna looked in the same spot on the sky at the same spot on the radio dot and didn't see it. So when you see something once, not science. But there could be a possible justification for the signal's disappearance. If an alien beacon was transmitting a signal intermittently, the telescopes would need to be pointed at the original source point until the next signal arrived. But scientists have no idea how long that cycle could be. It could take minutes, hours, days, or even years for the next one to arrive. Since scientists point the array at areas they find of interest on that day, it is possible to miss a transmission if the dishes are pointed away. Several attempts have been made to find the wow signal since, but with no further appearances, science is left without an explanation. There are people like me who believe that there is intelligent life out there, and they believe it enough to actually be listening 24-7. Inside the Array's lab, the team sees firsthand the detailed process of how the SETI scientists search for evidence of alien contact. If there are 56 million channels out there now, and you're sampling them once a second, well, that's 56 megabytes a second. What I actually discovered is that we have a lot in common with Seth Shawstack and the people at SETI. We're really looking for the same thing, some sort of proof that we have some cosmic company. You say they're there, we say they're here. Ideally, we can meet in the middle. The array will eventually expand to 350 telescopes an army of tools that will help survey over 100,000 stars and return 1,000 times more data in the next 20 years than all projects worldwide have accumulated to date. With this power, SETI hopes to have first contact with an extraterrestrial broadcast by the year 2025. With alien contact a scientific probability, the team is in search of physical evidence that alien contact is already an ongoing phenomenon here on Earth. They have uncovered two alleged contactees, two men from different cities who have filmed mysterious colored orbs close to their homes. They believe that these encounters are attempts at alien contact. Alien contact is often described as a close encounter, but these phenomena are not all the same. They are broken down into five separate levels, each increasing in intensity. Encounters of the first kind are described as up-close viewings at 600 feet or less, involving strange craft or lights that cannot be attributed to human technology. Encounters of the second kind involve physical effects seen or felt, heat or radiation, temporary paralysis, and interference with television or radio signals. The third kind is witnessing an actual being at close range. The fourth kind is physical abduction. And the fifth kind is communication, a complete reciprocal connection between an alien intelligence and a human being. Suffolk, Virginia, home to Terrell Copeland, a 25-year-old former United States Marine who has had recent encounters with pulsating orbs of light at close range, orbs that seem to be appearing around him more and more frequently. According to Copeland, they do not appear to be military aircraft from the nearby naval base. And over the past eight years, Terrell has had these encounters in three different areas, the Northwest Naval Base in nearby Chesapeake, his parents' home in Suffolk, and just outside his own apartment. The story is larger than somebody just seeing some objects in the sky. First of all, the objects are seeing him, and they've kind of focused in on him, and that tells me there's something going on. I joined the military in the summer of 2000. We were trained to observe. I've seen aircraft that maybe the typical civilian has not seen. In the winter of 2000, Terrell has an experience that will change his life. 
Late one night at the Northwest Naval Base in Chesapeake, somewhere between 3 and 4 a.m., Terrell sees a strange object illuminating the field below it with a spotlight. And I see a light, thinking maybe it's a chopper, but it made no noise, and it was only about 100 feet away. It went from being a yellowish light to a greenish kind of lime color light. It was a flying saucer, it was oval shaped. Terrell Copeland has had a close encounter of the first kind, a first-hand observation of a UFO at less than 600 feet. But sightings around Chesapeake Bay are not uncommon. The area is also home to the oldest UFO report in American history. Written in a letter sent to Thomas Jefferson in 1813, on July 31st, 1813, Edward Hansford, owner of the Washington Tavern in Portsmouth, Virginia, described his terrifying sighting as, quote, a ball of fire as large as the sun. And the object assumed several different forms as it, quote, ascended and descended. There is no indication that former President Jefferson received this letter but the letter still exists as proof of strange reported events in this area. Over the past two centuries, there has been a flurry of activity in this area. In fact, locals filed 12 reports in 2005 and 2006. On January 29, 2006, the Virginian Pilot newspaper reported, quote, formations over Virginia Beach that switched directions on a dime massive glowing shapes, and strange triangles hovering over Suffolk. But many of the sightings are made at far off distances. Terrell Copeland's encounters are happening at much closer range. For him, there's no mistaking these craft for human technology. When did you make that leap into thinking that we were dealing with some, some other kind of technology? I had a sighting back in 2005. Terrell's second encounter occurs over a three-night period at the end of October 2005, outside of his parents' home in Suffolk. On October 27th, at approximately 7 p.m., he sees a bluish orb moving across the sky. He can tell it's not a planet or a star, and when it appears again two nights later, on October 29th, he attempts to follow it. I try to chase it in my car. I was like, I want to see what this is, but it was gone, it, it left. On the third night, October 31st, sometime after 11 p.m., deep in the darkness of night, the orb appears again. And this time, Terrell is ready. He follows the object in his car down Constance Road. It leads him to an empty shopping plaza. But what happens next shocks him. The orb becomes two orbs. As this object moves over my head, I see that it's some type of craft that's larger than the shopping area that I'm in. In Suffolk, Virginia, Terrell Copeland has seen a mysterious blue orb over three nights at the end of October 2005. I drive up to this orb. The orb becomes two orbs. By the third night, October 31st, he has followed it to an empty shopping plaza where something incredible happens. He's about to have his second close encounter. The triangle-shaped craft hovers 500 to 700 feet above Terrell. He notices that the two orbs are actually lights that are part of the craft. The Virginian Pilot newspaper reports his initial reaction. Quote, at first I thought it was a stealth, referring to the Air Force's distinctively shaped radar evading bomber. Quote, but I saw many types of aircraft when I was in the military, and we don't have anything this big. Terrell has had a number of repeat sightings, all within 600 feet, close encounters of the first kind. These repeated sightings tell me there's much more to the story than meets the eye. He's being led down a path to contact. But just a year and a half later, Terrell has a third encounter. And according to him, it was very different. On March 5th, 2007, at approximately 8.05 p.m., in total darkness, he feels that something is outside his apartment. 
he grabs his video camera and heads out to a shocking sight. It was actually two objects out there, 25 or 35 feet away from me. The two objects appeared to hover in place, and then one began to behave very strangely. It looked like a big spear that was changing colors very violently. A lot of people in the UFO field have said that that sequence of changing colors, it's communicating. I believe that 100%. What if the flashing colors were like Morse code? What if this is actually a form of communication that extraterrestrials use to make contact? Was Terrell recording communication between the two objects? Or were the objects attempting to make contact with Terrell? The team will need to see the actual location to get a better viewpoint. This is the exact spot right here, March the 5th of 2007. There was a sphere that was whitish in color right over that building right there. And I look in this direction, there's another object here. As Terrell watches, this second object emits a series of pulsating colored lights. Terrell believes that these pulsing signals were, in fact, a way for that craft to communicate with the other single colored orb across from it. But as he moves, he notices that the multicolored object also begins to mirror his movement. As I got in my car, it moved to a position about 30 to 50 feet above the tree line. After I finished filming the footage, the object left because, from what I could see, a military chopper was in the area. So the helicopter comes in and these other objects leave? Right. As I turn to look at the chopper, I look back and the object is gone. Terrell is a former Marine. He is a trained observer. He knows all types of military aircraft. If he tells me that he had an experience that changed his life, I, I can believe him on that. But I do find it suspicious that we're also in an area where there is a military base nearby. With Terrell's recurring history of close encounters, the team must get further information. His video will be sent for analysis by Dr. Ted Ackworth, while Bill and Pat further investigate Terrell's escalating experiences. After videotaping his encounter in March of 2007, he receives a visit from a strange individual. This particular individual really didn't talk about the video at hand. They were more interested in me. They claimed to be a military contractor. They asked me a very strange question. They asked me um, if I was ready for the truth. And I said, sure, let's hear it. And this particular individual claimed that they have a personal relationship with extraterrestrials. What happened after this long conversation, I dozed off while reading the book. I woke up to someone trying to enter my apartment. My first instinct was to get up and grab my firearm. I clearly heard a voice in the room telling me that I don't need to grab that firearm. I could feel the book in my hands. I could feel myself sitting on the couch, but uh, I could not move at all. After I was able to get movement of my limbs, open the door, and uh, no one was there. After I spoke with this individual, I experienced something that I never would have dreamed of or even thought about, and that's uh, what they call missing time. That particular night and the night after, I woke up at 3.08 a.m. I don't recall a nightmare, I just jumped out of bed. And before I could blink, my alarm clock went off and it was 5.30, time for me to get up. It's not uncommon for UFO contactees and abductees to report missing time. These individuals consistently report being in one location at the time of the event and finding themselves at another location with no comprehension of the time in between. Temporary paralysis, that's an indicator of a close encounter of the second kind. Missing time is an indicator of an alien abduction. That's a close encounter of the fourth kind. Is he on a path to make contact? I'm just worried that we're just talking about a, a strange person here that's contacted Terrell and is kind of filling him with, with ideas. Here's a case where this person is contacting you and giving you a course of study dealing with the human relationship with aliens as the ultimate goal. I've got a funny feeling that you are being recruited and there is a branch of the government that you're being recruited for that somehow some way, you are a hybrid between an ET and a human. 
While the notion of alien-human hybrids is highly controversial and unproven, some contactees do claim to have developed unexplained physiological disorders shortly after the reported contacts. That's very surprising, but at the same time, not so surprising because the reason I'm not in the military today is because I have an unknown blood disorder. Terrell's blood disorder is a rare elevation of an enzyme called creatine kinase, which is typically released into the blood in abnormally high amounts when muscle damage occurs in the body. According to the Navy's official medical report, Terrell's CK level was tested to be as high as 2,000 UL. For normal, healthy people, this level rarely reaches above 200. But what causes this elevation of the enzyme in Terrell's blood has remained a mystery. None of the military doctors at the time uh, had a diagnosis. They were very baffled at it. Because the military doctors could not find a definitive reason for the elevated enzyme, Terrell was discharged from the military after only two years of service. Not long after, Terrell's most recent string of sightings began. How can you conclude that the guy is a hybrid? I mean, don't you think you're going off the deep end a little bit? This guy is getting a course of study in how to connect with his alien self. Listen, wait, you're not helping him. You're not helping him. You're telling him he can summon UFOs now? He's you're telling, telling him he's me. a hybrid? I'm telling you. This he's guy telling doesn't need, You're fanning the flames. We saw he's the hearing video. voices. We saw he's responding to people on you see the instant video. messaging. He's taking uh, instructions from people through email. I mean, these are all big red flags, Bill. Hybrids may exist, they may not, but for Bill to, to say that Terrell is a hybrid, uh, I, I don't think it's time for that yet. He really is deep into the UFO phenomenon, and he might not be seeing that perhaps Terrell just had an experience, he has some questions, and he really needs some, some more objective information. Are Terrell's early levels of close encounters a precursor to a level five encounter, full alien contact? The team concludes that they need to further analyze Terrell's footage and find an answer for his rare blood disorder. As the team delves deeper into the case, Terrell undergoes testing to determine what unknown effects his blood anomaly may be having. And could this video, shot by Michael Lee Hill of Cleveland, Ohio, over the waters of Lake Erie, be another attempt at alien contact? And what does it have in common with the footage Terrell Copeland shot just 500 miles away? What we're seeing here right has there. similar flight characteristics to other objects that we're seeing in other places. The team is currently investigating Terrell Copeland, who filmed two UFOs he believes were communicating with him. Soon after, he's visited by a strange individual and experiences missing time. The team believes these are all signs of early level alien contact. But claims of alien contact are not new. The stories go back for centuries. In 1758, Sweden's Emanuel Swedenborg publishes Concerning the Earths in Our Solar System, his own personal account of alien travels. He claims to journey throughout the entire solar system, seeing beings on Saturn, Mars, Venus, and several other planets. Interestingly, his extraterrestrial adventures only took him to Saturn, the furthest known planet at the time. In 1900, psychology professor Theodore Flournoy from the University of Geneva details the account of Helene Smith, who claims to have visited Mars. During a seance on August 22, 1897, she writes this phrase in what she claims is a Martian language, a language that she could also speak aloud. She claims to continue to have further contact throughout her life and even begins a series of paintings documenting her experiences. But by the 20th century, the visits are being reported on Earth itself for the first time. 1957, the Mojave Desert. On May 11th, Wayne S. Ahom, a U.S. military combat intelligence expert, sees a craft land and he says he makes contact with beings from inside. I was within a few feet of the craft. I went through an all-night experience and I was shown things of the future of this civilization. After his experience, Wayne is interviewed for over two hours by the CIA, but they decide not to reveal details of his account. But recent claims of contact have had a dark side. 
1983, Yorktown, New York. An engineer named John Falk reportedly sees a dark mass floating above the New Croton Falls Reservoir at night. The object begins projecting a red laser-like beam into the reservoir. But when the object notices him, it emits a blinding flash of white light, and he wakes up the next morning on the ground. 1997, Rancho Santa Fe, California. The infamous Heaven's Gate cult maintains they have contact with an alien ship in the tail of the Hale-Bopp comet. The only way to survive Earth's destruction is to commit suicide and allow their souls to be transported to the ship above. These claims of alien contact have evolved from the peaceful communications and visits of earlier centuries to the increasingly violent and foreboding contact of the modern era. What does this evolution in contact suggest? Are these most recent encounters benign or a sign of something else? The team moves on to investigate their second alleged contactee. Cleveland, Ohio, Michael Lee Hill is a 39-year-old musician who frequents the waters of Lake Erie for inspiration. But on the night of August 18, 2006, he sees something that changes his life and he captures it on video. For the next few months, he films orbs over and over again that he cannot explain in the exact same location. Are these orbs the same as the ones Terrell Copeland frequently encounters over Virginia? Skeptics have claimed that these orbs can be attributed to anything, from police vehicles to airplanes, but contactees believe they are real. So the team heads to the shore of Lake Erie to get Michael's point of view firsthand. Yeah, this is uh, Lake Shore Reservation Park. Some of the speculation about your footage is that you're filming lights on the other side of the yeah, lake. Yeah, you can't even no, see the other side see, of the lake. I mean, lake's 57 miles across. People say that your footage is uh, helicopters and airplanes, but uh, you say no. Why is that? We're right next to uh, Perry Nuclear Power Plant. And since 9-11, uh, you know, the terrorist attacks, there's no fly zones put around all nuclear facilities. Perry Nuclear Power Plant is located 35 miles northeast of Cleveland. Since September 11th, TFRs, or quote, temporary flight restrictions, have been put in place around this area. According to Section 99.7 in the Code of Federal Regulations, quote, pilots must be aware of a standing notice advising them to avoid the airspace above or in proximity to sites such as nuclear power plants, dams, refineries, military installations, and other similar facilities. The actual maneuvers that these objects are doing don't seem to fit the profile of, oh, yeah, of aircraft, yeah. right? No, they're, they're hovering. If it's one solid sphere of pulsating light, there's nothing that I know of any airplane that's flying around with one big ball of light. Especially you know, around a nuclear power plant. With it difficult to attribute Michael's sightings to aircraft above the lake, the team has a credible reason to believe that Michael's repeated encounters are similar to Terrell's and may be evidence of attempted alien contact. Their next step is to compare Michael's footage to Terrell's and find out how long he has been having these experiences. This right here is just one of the single orbs that I was telling you about. Okay. It's just one big orb of light. Another of the same objects is going to come in from the right, and it's going to hover right over top of the first one. At this point, I, I realize this is just crazy. So you're going to see, I'm going to flip the camera right now, infrared. What we're seeing here right has there. similar flight characteristics to other objects that we're seeing in other places. Well, Copa's down in Suffolk. I mean, this is the same. Mm -hmm. It's pulsating. It has the changing colors. Mm -hmm. wow. It has the orbs coming together. Since this encounter, Michael noticed that the activity over the lake died down for almost a year, until September of 2007, when he took this new footage, which the team is seeing for the first time. These objects would just come up right in front of me over and over again for about an hour and a half straight. They actually kind of go dark, and you can't see them anymore, and then they'll, they'll come back, and they'll get really bright. Now, as I'm filming this, another one shows up right next to it. 
Now, if these were flares, they would be floating and dropping. The same night, we had this beautiful orange harvest moon, and mm -hmm. these objects started showing up under the moon. I'm worried that the second object is a ghost image in the camera. Once I get it in frame and I got it, I'll take a peek at it. We'll always use your binoculars. Mike's footage is really impressive simply because of the size of Lake Erie and the fact that it's a no-fly zone. There's nothing around for something like 60 miles. It really makes these lights that Michael Lee Hill is videotaping very remarkable. But are these objects new, or have they been seen before? March 4, 1988, according to the Cleveland Plain dealer, Sheila Baker sees several small triangular objects shooting out of a huge metallic gray football-shaped object descending over Lake Erie. The U.S. Coast Guard even witnesses this event and makes a written report. Quote, the smaller objects began hovering in the area where the large object landed. They appeared to be scouting the area. They were never able to fully resolve this event. The description of these objects approaching the lake is eerily similar to Michael's footage from August 18, 2006. But Michael's encounters go further back than the team realizes. I've had contact my whole life. Have they uncovered a level five contactee? The team is in Cleveland, Ohio, and they've just seen footage by Michael Lee Hill of strange objects hovering over Lake Erie. These types of spheres have been seen before, and the team believes he may be experiencing early stages of contact just like Terrell Copeland of Suffolk, Virginia. But Michael reveals his experience with contact goes much deeper than Terrell's. I know this is gonna sound weird, but I've had contact my whole life. I got memories of what we consider graves now. I woke up, I was getting ready. I looked down and there's blood on the floor. But I wiped it up, went about my business, started to brush my teeth, I looked down, there's more blood. I could never find any incisions or anything or anything weird. A couple days after that, I woke up, actually, like, during people working on me. And I was in a bed, strapped down, and I just told this being that was right here to my right, I said, listen, I'm awake, I'm aware, I know what you're doing, and it hurts. So have you had any subsequent contact? One of the weirdest things that have happened is I walked out my back door, and there was a little plasma device hovering by my studio. There's two spheres on either side of it with a shaft and each sphere looked like a plasma ball. Are these spheres outside Michael's home the same spheres Terrell is seeing? I drive up to this orb, the orb becomes two orbs. We've heard this over and over again. Yeah, People describe some kind of luminescent light that doesn't actually radiate light. It yeah. emanates light, it's internal. Now you have the sense that these objects are showing up almost to as a contact to you to guide you along. I know that they know I'm filming them. I really think I'm in contact with something higher mm -hmm. and you didn't listen. That would be probably the stupidest thing you could possibly ever do. This is an incredible case. He has gone through all five close encounters from the first all the way to direct alien contact. With Michael and Terrell's footage now in hand, the team has a chance to look at both videos side by side and determine if there is any connection between these two possible contactees. Dr. Ted Ackworth has received copies of both Terrell and Michael's footage. He will first attempt to determine whether or not the lights and images can be discounted due to camera flare or other optical interference. All right, Jeff, we've got these two pieces of footage, which uh, Bill and Pat think might be of the same object. I'm curious why there's a black spot in the center of that object. Me too. I mean, to me, that screams defocus. If either of the cameras was not focused correctly, three lights could appear to be one. The edges of the light, or lights, would be blurry, and it would be difficult to tell the size or shape of the objects. You know, is it chromatic aberration from the electronics in the camera that's making the, the color changes? I mean, see that, the reds that are being introduced. Chromatic aberration can be caused by the lens of the camera. A lower quality lens cannot focus on more than one color, 
so colors fringe or bleed into one another, making things unclear. If it were internal reflection, they would all have to pulse at the same rate. And, and actually, they don't look like they are. Do you think we could rule that out? Probably. But do these reported UFOs share any common traits with known earthly lights? It doesn't look like an incandescent light or, or naturally made by man. I've never seen anything like that in imagery. I can't explain what that would be from. The lights not only hover and move, unlike comets or meteors, they do not have the same appearance of FAA lights required for aircraft to display. The differing color and pulses also do not match any known police or military vehicles. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to back out exactly what's going on. Could these spheres, seen 500 miles apart, be the same object or group of objects? At the beginning of the first Terrell Copeland sequence, we are seeing a single point. And that looks something like the uh, Michael Lee Hills. Side by side, Terrell and Michael's videos both clearly display single point orbs of light. Their basic appearance and movement are similar, but the camera techniques and shooting conditions are vastly different, making further comparisons difficult to make. I think I'm seeing some of the same color fringing effects and perhaps some of the same defocus effects. The information contained in the footage is so low. Even with you know, state-of-the-art processing, I'm not sure we'll be able to extract enough information to really tell definitively what these are. Bottom line is it's very hard for these, these sort of consumer-grade video cameras to take quality images uh, in these conditions. The team must now look into a new angle of comparison for Terrell and Michael. They seize on perhaps the very best scientific comparison left, Terrell's blood condition. The team brings both Michael and Terrell to Boston to determine once and for all if there is a link between these two alleged contactees. The tests are in. There is an abnormality here. And the final analysis reveals a remarkable connection. It looks like what you're looking for, you found. After investigating the claims of two independent contactees, Terrell Copeland of Suffolk, Virginia, and Michael Lee Hill of Cleveland, Ohio, the team has reassembled in Boston for the final step in the investigation. The team breaks into two groups to bring their subjects to the hospital. Terrell is scheduled to undergo a thorough examination led by one of the leading doctors in the cardiopulmonary field, Dr. David Sistrom. We're at Massachusetts General Hospital. We're meeting with Dr. David Sistrom, who's the director of the Cardiopulmonary Exercise Laboratory. Terrell has a history of an elevated level of the enzyme creatine kinase in his blood, a rare disorder that is usually indicative of muscle damage. But how does it relate to alien contact? The team is looking to see if the enzyme is still present today, and for an explanation if it is, one that Terrell's military doctors could not provide. Dr. Sistrom has set up a series of tests for exactly this purpose. This particular test is a pretty good one at saying, A, are you normal or not compared to people of your age and your body size? A lot of times with disorders of muscle and heart and lungs, we'll only find abnormalities with the stress of exercise. We'll take them up until we can't go any further, and then we hope to get some answers at peak exercise. If there is an abnormality, we can begin to point at the nature of the abnormality. We can determine whether it's your lungs limiting you, whether it's your heart limiting you, or whether it's your muscle limiting you. And it's, that's the important one, I think, from the sound of your history, that we're going to determine whether there's an abnormality of muscle metabolism here. As Terrell completes his testing, Michael arrives to have his blood drawn for a full analysis as well. Shortly before we investigated your case in Cleveland, we went out to visit a young ex-Marine in Virginia who's also experiencing UFO sightings. And uh, the video that we've looked at seems very similar. Wow. However, Terrell, the other gentleman, has a rare blood anomaly. Right. So seeing as how you are experiencing UFOs and visitation, we think that uh, you may also have some kind of blood anomaly. We're gonna get Michael Lee Hill's blood tested as well. And if he has high levels of the enzyme CK, that could be the real key to this case. 
interesting thing today is that we have an elevation of the creatine kinase again. Mm -hmm. But the peculiar thing now, if we're seven to eight years out, for it to persist is most unusual. Normally, elevation of creatine kinase is a sign of muscular injury. For it to have persisted in Terrell's blood for this long suggests that there is another problem altogether. I'm wondering if um, the one patient and uh, Terrell Copeland's blood, what you found uh, either similar or dissimilar about their tests. There was a marker of generic inflammation, not specifically of the muscle that was abnormally elevated. Both tests show that Terrell and Michael have an elevation of the enzyme in their blood. I think that's as far as I can take it in terms of comparisons. Though the doctor will not speculate if there's a connection between the elevated levels in the two blood samples or what the source of the anomaly could have been, both Terrell and Michael have the elevated enzyme in common. With these surprising results in, the team decides it's time to bring Terrell and Michael together for the very first time. Both of you are not abductees, your contactees, very unique. I've seen different crafts, different shapes, sizes. A lot of times I know they're out because whenever I feel this, it's not an energy that you can hear, but you can feel it. And I know that they're out. I think it's some type of communication. Every year it's kind of progressed where they've got closer and closer. I truly believe that that's what all this is leading to, a meeting with a biological entity. You have no doubt that something's in communication with you because it will grow to the point where it'll take all doubt away. Now that Terrell and Michael have discovered they share similar experiences of contact, the team reveals the astonishing results of their tests. We found something pretty interesting. In both cases, you have an elevated level of CK, or what's called creatine kinesis. Terrell, in your case, because we were able to do those cardiopulmonary tests, Dr. Sistrom felt this elevated level of CK was directly related to your muscle tissue. Mike, in your case, he didn't have enough information to know what the source of your elevated CK was. He just figured it was a more general sort of systemic elevation. Perhaps you share, could share some kind of common, unusual physiological trait in your blood. Didn't this just prove that? I mean, it tells me that were I to do any kind of medical testing, on self-described contactees, I would certainly look for that as a marker to facilitate a certain level of contact. Bill, that would be a pretty interesting experiment. If we collected together uh, a dozen or two dozen uh, abductees and tested their CK level, which is easy enough to do mm -hmm. just with a simple blood test, uh, it would be pretty interesting to find that if across all 12 or 24 people that was present, that would be pretty compelling. To find out that he shares some of my experiences even some of my blood characteristics, that's just phenomenal. There are some really interesting connections between the cases of Michael and Terrell. I just don't know if, if we're looking at just UFO sightings or if these guys have actually made alien contact. Some of the video footage looked like it might have some similarities. Maybe they were looking at the same thing. As far as a blood test goes, you know, we did a comprehensive set of, of blood analyses. The only thing that we found that was unusual across the two sets was the cytokines. I think that they are definitely connected in some way because we got two people with high CK levels that are reporting the same phenomena. I think after our comprehensive analysis, we have found no provable connections, no provable links. In both cases, there was something beneath the surface. I mean, sometimes we have to be happy with this, that the real answers lie in the quest and not in the solution. Today, Voyager 1 continues its journey into deep space, carrying with it proof of our existence on Earth. But NASA believes it will be 40,000 years before the craft reaches the nearest planetary system and possibly makes contact with others like us. Meanwhile, with more and more contactees coming forward here on Earth, many wonder if the contact has already begun. On the evening of August 21, 2004, residents of the small village of Tinley Park, Illinois, casually gaze up to the skies and soon realize they're not alone. A mass sighting of three strange red lights grips this tiny suburb on the outskirts of Chicago. These lights were observed by thousands of people. 
I saw three red lights. This was definitely not an airplane. It was unlike anything I'd seen before or after. The sightings spiral out from Tinley Park to towns all across the Chicago Southland. Residents are left without an explanation. There are UFOs, I swear to God, this is no bull And these lights may be part of a worldwide visitation. Now, for the first time, witnesses are coming forward. Tony Park Police Station was being inundated with phone calls. So everybody was calling the cops. With never before seen footage of the Tinley Park lights. There's something there and I can't explain what it is. I got it on tape, I got it! This is case number 97001, Invasion, Illinois. Right outside our front window, we were able to see it. Three red lights in the sky. August 21st, 2004, Tinley Park, Illinois. In this quiet suburb, just 30 miles south of Chicago, many are taking advantage of what they think will be a normal summer night. They're gathered at block parties, at barbecues, and at a local concert by rocker Ozzy Osbourne. The mood is festive and the skies are clear, but not for long. I got it on tape, I got it! The first of over 50 reports begin pouring in to local authorities just after 7 p.m. There's something strange in the skies above Tinley Park. Three bright red-orange lights that seem at times to be flying in a triangular formation and sometimes in a straight line. Actual video from that night shows the lights moving silently and slowly from west to east over the Tinley Park area, often visible for as long as 30 minutes. By 9 p.m., reports of the strange lights spread like wildfire over the Chicago suburbs. Tinley Park, Lake in the Hills, Oak Forest, Orland Park, Mokina, Madison, Frankfurt. I saw three red lights in the sky. They were kind of hovering and changing formations from a triangle to like a three in a row, one, like dot, dot, dot. And this thing just floated across the sky from southwest to northeast. Here we are at the first Midwest Bank Amphitheater, formerly known as the Tweeter Center, the site on August 21st, 2004 of OzFest. On that night, people leaving the amphitheater after the concert was over got caught in a traffic jam. And in the traffic jam, they're looking up and they see dazzling light formations in the sky. Now we know what some people might say. I mean, it was an OzFest concert. Of course people are going to see lights in the sky. The Tinley Park case should have the makings for a really interesting case. There's a lot of evidence. We've got a lot of witness testimony spread over a wide geographic area. And the case is really fresh. It's current. And the people in Tinley Park weren't alone. This isn't just a regional mass sighting. The team believes this may be a worldwide event. A similar set of lights is captured on tape two days prior in British Columbia, Canada, then in Minnesota. The day after the Tinley Park sightings, August 22nd, the lights appear in Houston, Texas, and this actual video appears to show objects hovering over Melbourne, Australia the very next day. Triangle-shaped encounters are on the rise, joining the more traditional cigar and saucer-shaped reports. Sightings of strange triangle-shaped craft skyrocketed in the early 1980s. The military's unveiling of both the F-117 stealth fighter 
and the B-2 stealth bomber in November 1988 helped explain a number of these accounts. Still, many mysteries remain. The mysterious Belgium UFO of 1990, seen here, and the Phoenix Lights Triangle of 1994 have become landmark cases. Now it's up to the team to find out if the Tinley Park Triangle is part of this greater phenomenon. October 31st, 2004, Halloween. The triangle returns to the skies over Tinley Park. The red lights are back. They're over about the 80th Avenue train station. And again, are seen and taped by large groups of people. Hey Dad, speed up as close as you can get on this thing. The debunkers tell us these are flares. These are flares attached to balloons that are hovering in the air. Could these lights, witnessed by hundreds and maybe thousands, be simply a hoax or something else entirely? The Tinley Park investigation is underway as several angles are explored. Pat Uskert is collecting video evidence from the eyewitnesses and attempting to pinpoint the precise locations of each sighting. At this point, we really need to see a lot more information. I need to see more video. I need to talk to more people. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Former NASA analyst Dr. Ted Ackworth will use Pat's data and the videos to scientifically calculate the size and speed of this object and with this information, attempt to identify it. Are these three points of light all fixed together as part of one rigid object? And if so, how big is this thing? And Bill Burns tests an alleged hoax to see whether the lights are actually flares attached to balloons. We may not know what these lights were, but by the end of this investigation, we're sure gonna find out what these lights were not. We're meeting Sam Moranto, uh, director of Illinois MUFON. He's our main contact here on the ground in Tinley Park. Sam was the point man. In, in, in cop shop terms, he's the squeal man for this case. He takes the first call. When everyone saw the lights, they contacted him. He's actually been in touch with all the people who have the footage, uh, the eyewitnesses, uh, the people who say they saw uh, this, this thing in the sky, whatever it was. I think I probably interviewed well in excess of 100 people. According to Sam, the Tinley Park events are among the best documented UFO sightings ever. Many people have seen UFOs. Rarely do they report them. You rarely even get so much as a, a picture out of uh, uh, most UFO cases. Approximately 25 to 30 videos exist, shot simultaneously from different parts of Tinley Park and the surrounding suburbs. There are still many more people to see and uh, talk to, more footage to recover, and I think this case is evolving. This thing was seen by thousands of people. It did make newspapers, uh, uh, you know, nationally, in Illinois, and, and even around the world. So Pat goes right to the source, a correspondent from the local paper, the Southtown Star. I'm meeting with Jason Freeman. As a journalist, he's, he's objective. He doesn't really have anything to gain from this. He's just interested in, in getting at the truth, very much like we are. You know, I was amazed. Um, but, you know, you can never take the reporter out of yourself. So uh, I, I immediately started to, to you know, kind of get the scene. Those people who hadn't seen it, um, you know, already had their minds made up that, that it was uh, what the media said it was, road flares or whatever, all these other explanations. Whereas I think the people that saw it, and myself included, uh, a little bit more open-minded. Jason writes a column about his own personal experience. I got out of my car and tried as hard as I could to get a better view of the anomalies. What exactly was it that I and hundreds of other Tinley Park residents saw that night? I'm not sure. In speaking with a journalist, it's, it's important to keep in mind that he's been trained to just record events as they occur, as unbiased as possible. To my knowledge, no one ever uh, officially explained what they were, which leads me to, you know, scratch my head even more. 
the police department adamantly said that these were not uh, weather balloons but flares. Uh, in fact, every other agency said the same thing. The uh, FAA said this was something that they don't know what it was because it didn't register on their radar. Within 35 miles of Tinley Park are Chicago O'Hare and Midway airports. How could radar operators at two of the nation's busiest airports not pick up an object seen by so many witnesses? The FAA has no answer, which causes the team to rule out commercial or private planes. Perhaps the best evidence may lie in the video. This is a unique scenario because we have so much very good footage. Sam has at least 15 distinct pieces of videotape that capture the bizarre phenomena. This was the August 21st, 2004 sighting, mass sighting. This segment of footage is from Oak Forest. I don't know what that is. I wonder how many more there are going to be, but you know what, that was really cool when it was the three of them. I don't know. Do you really think we should call and report this? Three miles to the southwest, in Tinley Park proper, another witness, T.J. Jabcon, shoots this footage of the lights. Are you recording this? Yeah, now I am. While he's shooting footage further southwest, they're shooting footage from the northeast. So they're actually shooting the same phenomena simultaneously. So this is great. This is a triangulation on one phenomena that both cameras pick up. From every angle, in every neighborhood, eyewitness video captures the lights in the same triangular formation. The various lights almost stayed rigid with respect to each other as they moved through the sky. Do flares do the same thing? I think it would be premature to, to jump into this and say we're looking at some sort of a huge extraterrestrial phenomenon or, or giant craft over Tinley Park. What we have is, is three points of light in the sky and I'd like to keep it right there until I get more information. Skeptics claim there is an ordinary explanation for the Tinley Park sightings, but the multiple witnesses don't agree. Never before seen footage from that night may finally provide the answer. I knew it wasn't a plane or aircraft of any kind that I've ever seen. There was no noise. So we were kind of amazed and just started to think what it could be. And I really have no answer for that. The team is in Tinley Park, Illinois, investigating multiple appearances of an alleged triangle-shaped UFO. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, from lawyers and doctors to concert goers, claim to have seen three strange reddish lights in the sky on two separate nights in 2004. One witness, two witnesses, that's not enough. We need to get as many witnesses as possible, look at as much evidence as possible, analyze as many videos as possible, and, and from there put a picture together. Pat heads out to meet with T.J. Jackcon, an eyewitness who was able to capture the alleged UFO on video. While Bill meets with Ted to find out what else might be flying over Tinley Park. One question I always have when we have sightings of lights overhead at night is what's going on with commercial airliners and maybe even military uh, aircraft operations. If we can rule out those kinds of aircraft, that leaves uh, a lot of evidence on the table that might lead to something anomalous. Situated within 30 miles of both Chicago O'Hare and Midway airports, the skies above Tinley Park are some of the most congested airspace in the United States. The air is filled with commercial and private aircraft that could be mistaken for something extraterrestrial. According to the team, the strange object might also be a misidentified military craft, but they feel this explanation is unlikely. There is a military operation area way to the north here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about uh, it's roughly 100 miles away. And there's another one way to the southeast, also on the order of 100 miles. So I wouldn't say, A, there's no military operation area, and B, you're not going to get the military operating right in the middle of this massive international commercial airspace without causing a lot of trouble. 
Still, Bill tries to get some kind of official statement from the military on the Tinley Park phenomenon. He contacts the group commander, a senior military official at nearby Scott Air Force Base. Yes, hi, I'm Bill Burns from UFO Hunters and UFO Magazine. Uh, I'm calling uh, in reference to the August 21st, 2004 lights over Tinley Park. Uh, I'm calling to find out what traffic the military had that night. You have no information about that. I understand, I understand. According to the official Air Force response received by UFO Hunters, quote, we do not have any documentation on this at all due to the high turnover of military personnel that have left since 2004, we don't have anyone that could possibly speak on this. Now, we've got to get to the witness locations. We have to interview the witnesses. The more videos we have and the more witness statements we can get, the more scientific data we can get over to TED to analyze on the workbench to see what we really have in front of us. I saw three red lights that were slowly hanging in the sky. It was the most incredible thing I had ever seen. I've never seen anything like it before. I've never seen anything like those lights. 10.45 p.m., August 21st, 2004. T.J. Japcon and Dave Wagner are at a block party with approximately 70 friends and neighbors. They have no idea that their party is about to have some uninvited guests. My son had seen three lights come up right above the trees. Are you zoomed in all the way? Yeah, Jake, look at that. Okay, wait, leave it. Okay, it's a UFO. Someone's saying UFO, and I did turn around finally, and I saw it, and I'm like, what in the world are these things? We, we've just never seen anything yeah, like that Everybody was just staring at it. Just, it just floated across the sky. Three red lights and like a triangle. TJ gets his video camera and manages to capture the object on tape for an incredible 18 minutes. It's definitely not a helicopter. It's going too slow for a helicopter, too. That's going right over us. As they watch, they believe the object is maneuvering in ways beyond the capacity of conventional aircraft. It, it took time. about 15 or 20 minutes to move from here to over there. Then it stayed, it stayed stationary for a little while, and then it crawled again. So it actually stopped at one it point? It stopped, yeah. yeah. So it moved across the sky, stopped, and then it continued moving. Yeah. Yep. Wow. The slow pace and stationary hovering of the object is highly inconsistent with typical aircraft flight behavior, and these locals know it. When a police officer stops by the block party, he is bombarded with questions about the object. We had stopped him, and we asked him what was going on, and he goes, right now, he goes, I can't talk. He has to get back to the station because the station, uh, Tilly Park Police Station, was being inundated by phone calls. Yeah, so everybody was calling the cops. Everyone was calling the police. UFO hunters contacted the Tinley Park Police Station for a statement. The officer in charge had no comment on the case, but their own incident dispatch report shows they did receive calls of red lights in the sky that night. After half an hour, the object slowly disappears into the night. Whoa! Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Gone. But around 11.30 p.m., TJ and Dave have another sighting, a single red point of light that follows the same path as the object seen earlier. Oh, come on. Kurt, they're back. The UFOs are back. This time, Dave is ready. He has a high-powered telescope in hand. I didn't see any sides or anything, but from the naked eye, it looked like one dot in the sky. But through the telescope, it looked oval-shaped with about 10 or, red, 10 or 12 red lights around it. Pat collects TJ's video and other data for Ted to analyze. He uses a GPS locator to plot the precise location of the sighting. Next, a clinometer helps establish how far off the horizon the alleged UFO appeared to be. Finally, compass readings pinpoint the trajectory of the UFO across the sky. Definitely the footage that TJ just showed me is very similar to the footage I saw earlier with Sam. 
these are definitely videos of the same event, the same lights over uh, Tinley Port, whatever they were. What was this object? What was its size? And how far away was it from the witnesses? Or was it an object at all? In order to complete the triangulation, Ted will need data from one final location. With this information, he can also start estimating the size and speed of what these people were seeing, and perhaps even identify it. That same night, Bob Peterson is with his children in his backyard when he sees the same triangle-shaped object. Dawson, go ask mom for the telephone. I want to call somebody. What made you take notice of these lights? I just happened to look up, and there were three red lights in the sky. And it, it was definitely an odd thing to see. We are kind of in a flight pattern here from Midway Airport. There's a lot of activity uh, as far as planes are concerned. So at first, I did think they were helicopters, but as they got closer, I mean, they were dead silent. There was just no noise coming from them. So at that point, you know, it, it wasn't a helicopter. How about airplanes? No, it's way too slow. Despite his sighting, Bob is not convinced that he has seen anything extraordinary. My opinion is there, there was some type of hoax put on. I, I don't know what it would be. Bill Dooley, Bob's friend and neighbor, also witnesses the lights. But his reaction is very different. We actually had a high-powered telescope back here at the time. And one of our friends got right on it. But he said it looked just like we're seeing it with our naked eye. I thought it was something some kind of flare or something like that. You know, we thought about that, that you would see some kind of smoke, and we didn't. Again, Pat takes the crucial location data for both Bob and Bill's sightings. With three distinct locations, his data compilation is complete and ready to send to Ted. But before Ted comes to any kind of conclusion, the team has a critical experiment to perform, one that will put them directly into the eye of the storm. If it was a hoax, they did a really good job, whoever created the hoax. That's all I could say. Skeptics and debunkers claim that the three bright red lights seen by hundreds of witnesses in the skies above Tinley Park, Illinois, are nothing more than flares attached to weather balloons. But those who actually saw the lights with their own eyes hold a different opinion. My son and I were on the phone together watching the UFO. Planes lights normally flash, but these um, lights didn't flash. It was, it was exciting and it was disturbing. Dr. Ted Ackworth has worked for NASA's Flying Imaging Aircraft Program. He is joined by Terence Masson, an image processing expert from Northeastern University. They begin by analyzing footage shot by T.J. Japcon on August 21, 2004. Ted feels it has the highest image quality of the nearly 30 pieces of video UFO hunters have collected. My first thought was it was going to be necessary to stabilize because these are shot by uh, normal people, background, um, handheld, so we've got you know, this kind of swimming motion. Of, sure. Uh, that's pretty yeah. typical. Once we've done that, uh, I was able to then uh, pick one of the three lights and translationally pin that so that all of the related emotion is basically locked around that point. Having stabilized one point of the three, Ted and Terrence are able to see how the other two points move around it. Are they free floating or locked in place? To me, uh, and the numbers bear it out, that it does look like the, uh, the other two trailing points are locked to that third nodal point uh, in rotating. So either they're fixed to the same physical structure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a triangular craft, or they, if, if it's um, man-made, uh, they have to be some kind of I-beam, some kind of physical connection. Mm -hmm. If the lights are all connected, why do they sometimes appear as a triangle and other times appear as a straight line? Is the object shape-shifting. Ted and Terence's analysis shows that's not the case. The most likely answer is, as the attached lights move in the sky, the only thing that shifts is the viewer's perspective. 
to my eye, it appeared that those three lights seemed to be locked together geometrically, and his analysis uh, agreed with that. We now quantitatively know that those three points of light are locked in, in space together. Ted and Terence still cannot determine whether there is a solid triangular craft with a light on each point or three individual lights that are somehow able to rotate together. One segment of TJ's footage from October 31st, 2004 shows a conventional aircraft, a helicopter, flying near the triangle shape. The team contacted all local airports, the FAA, Pilots of America, and numerous other aviation organizations in hopes of finding the pilot. One pilot responded saying he had been in the air and saw something strange that night. When asked for an interview, he refused, claiming he feared for his job. I'm hoping that we can get a sense of the overall size. You know, is this thing uh, 10 feet across or uh, a quarter mile across? We could take the height of that helicopter image in this mm -hmm. frame right. uh, and, and compare that to the height of the, the right. lights and calculate the distance between right. those two lights. Because spatially, just in the uh, the imagery uh, itself, it's probably about 30 times the, the linear width of this helicopter, right? Yeah, that's getting up to 1,000 feet A thousand, plus. say 1,000 feet as yeah. opposed to the width of the helicopter. So based, based on this method, I think we're in the ballpark, you know, uh, of 1,000 a, a plus feet mm -hmm. in separation between these, these, uh, right. these three lights. With their estimate of 1,000 feet between the points of light, Ted and Terrence plug in the location data that Pat has gathered from the eyewitnesses. The GPS locator pinpoints each sighting on the map. The clinometer reading reveals the angle of elevation, or how high off the horizon the lights appear to be. Compass readings indicate in which direction the alleged UFO is traveling. Without this additional information, no true estimate of the size of the object can be made. Based on the clinometer and compass readings, the witnesses all appear to have seen the same object to the west and low to the horizon, between 5 and 10 degrees. And we know from the footage here from, from TJ, which is, is taken from here, looking in that direction, yep. at about a, a, roughly a 10 degree elevation, that our object is, is approximately that distance away from right. TJ. And we figured that was about two and a half miles. If the unknown object is two and a half miles away, at an average of seven degrees off the horizon, and with 1,000 feet between each point of light, then they can estimate its total size. I think 1,500 is a pretty good estimate, plus or minus a couple few hundred feet. It's definitely not the, uh, the, uh, the distance from wingtip to wingtip of anything that... Absolutely not. And I don't know any structure that you could fly that, would, no. that could hold lights 1,500 right. feet apart. To the best of their knowledge, the alleged UFO over Tinley Park is one object several thousand feet in the air and about 1,500 feet from end to end. To put that into a reference to something we might know, think of a 747 or, or the newer uh, A380 aircraft. Those are about 200, 250 feet in wingspan. So we would have to stack up about six of these to get the span that we're seeing from our evidence in this case. And that's just beyond, that, that's like 6x, the largest aircraft that we have. Based on all of this evidence, the video, the spatial recreation, the estimation of motion, uh, the image processing, uh, I don't know what it is. There's definitely something out there of this 1,500 feet uh, span, but uh, I have no idea what it might be. This could be an elaborate hoax. People say that there were red flares in the sky. Don't think that it was some type of a spacecraft. Um, it, there just wasn't any evidence to me that it was anything other than three, three lights that were not connected. 
Although there's never been an official explanation for the lights over Tinley Park, uh, there are some people who believe that these were nothing more than flares tied to balloons. And it's an interesting theory, one that we have to test. So that's what we're doing here today. We're actually going to set some balloons with flares aloft and see if they look anything like the uh, Tinley Park footage from 2004. Cleared by local authorities, the test will allow the team to compare the color and intensity of the flares, as well as the way the balloons and flares move in the night sky, with the original footage of the lights over Tinley Park. But Ted's analysis proved the lights were connected by something solid. So if this was a hoax, it was rather elaborate. We suspect that there's a frame between the lights, an object between the lights that you can't see in the darkness. So what we're doing to test this out is we're building triangles out of the PVC pipe and attaching flares to the end of those corners. So in effect, we're making our own flying triangles out of flares and balloons. Let's see what they look like compared to the footage we have. As the team unloads their equipment, the weather begins to take a turn for the worse. Much worse. We're looking at major lightning right now, big storm coming this way. We have to shut this thing down and get inside and get some shelter. Bill and Pat manage to get the materials for the experiment inside but the danger is far from over. They don't call this Tornado Alley by accident. I grew up in California, we just don't have this. Uh, I've, you know, I've seen lightning before, I've heard a little bit of thunder. This is, uh, what, what can I say, welcome to Illinois. As you can hear, we've got a lot of bad weather coming in. The team is in rural Illinois in a controlled environment supervised by local authorities. In spite of the weather, the team soldiers on, building the PVC frame. Three weather balloons, five feet in diameter, are filled with helium gas and attached to the frame. But it soon becomes apparent that the frame is too heavy for the balloons to lift. The larger we got, the heavier the frame got and the more impossible it was for the balloons to lift this thing. So it just seems like if they're, if they're describing a giant triangle, there's just no way these balloons could lift this thing. It would take possibly hundreds or even thousands of balloons to lift a structure that large. They know from Ted's analysis the object is massive and the lights are connected. It's unclear how such a hoax could be possible. Still, the team works to get the balloons airborne and in formation in order to compare the flares to the strange lights on the videos. I think the lightning has passed. We may have a window to launch. Sam Moranto and several eyewitnesses from 2004, Bill Dooley and his son Nick, and Bob Peterson and his son Tyler arrive for the test. Since they saw the lights with the naked eye originally, they're the best witnesses to tell us, hey, this looks like the lights we saw, this didn't look like the lights we saw. For test purposes, they've also brought the same cameras they filmed the Tinley Park lights with in August of 2004. So what we want to do is maybe use their cameras to take footage of the balloons that we launch and compare them to their footage from 2004. Let's see how it matches up. The three balloons are attached on a line at 15-foot intervals. A flare is then suspended from each balloon. Gentlemen, light your flares. Make one launch. Balloon two. Go ahead, Dave. While Sam and the team have only seen the video evidence of the Tinley Park lights, Bob, Bill, and their sons are eyewitnesses. They know firsthand what the object looked like in 2004. The quality of the colors, the way it held its triangular form, and how it moved across the night sky. 
Now what we saw in the summer of 2004 was much steadier flow of light, not jerking around like they did. The color was bright red like you'd see a light on top of a cell tower. Uh, this was more orange, more pink, so no, nothing like it. Bob Peterson's initial impression is that the 2004 lights are a hoax. But this demonstration has given him a new perspective. Based on what I saw tonight, no, I don't think it was a flare. Um, it, there's, there was just too much that was different about it. He thought they were flares, but now he's looking at flares. And he says they did not behave the way the lights behaved when he first saw them on August 21st and October 31st. A final meeting with Sam Maranto reveals that the night of the original sighting, August 21st, 2004, may be part of a worldwide UFO flap. And Tinley Park's history of UFO sightings didn't begin in 2004. As you may have already found out and have some indication, this area has been a hotbed for activity. Project Blue Book, the Air Force actual investigation into UFO phenomena, actually had one of their cases here in Tinley Park. What was the case? The case was um, two young men seeing an unusual object. They reported it, and it was investigated. It still remains unknown. And that was in the early 60s. Was there any other activity around uh, the case that we're working with now? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Pat. We had August a hot month. Objects very similar to what was seen out here was seen on the 18th in Canada. On the 19th, we have that object over Minneapolis-St. Paul hovering there for a period of almost nine hours. Then here we go, the 21st in Tinley Park. After that, Houston, Texas. A few hours later into the 23rd, what do we have in Melbourne, Australia? Same thing again. Is it possible that these were all sightings of the same object? What was the date of the Australia sighting? The Australia sighting was on the 23rd, but remember, their date line is ahead of us by 16 hours. What are the chances of these lights popping up here and then in Australia uh, a on couple days next, later? On the very next day. Sam Moranto has uncovered video from Australia that appears to show two of the Tinley Park type objects seen here for the first time. Oh no, my battery's running out. Oh, no, Mom. On September 30th, 2005, the same configuration of lights returns to Tinley Park and again is widely seen and taped by the residents. The object appears to be the same one seen in 2004, and yet another sighting occurs barely a month later, on October 31st, Halloween 2005. With all of the evidence gathered for this case, the team waits for Ted to weigh in on the experiment. How will the new footage stand up to the original 2004 video of the mysterious lights over Tinley Park? When I saw those three lights in the footage, nothing came to mind instantly that, hey, oh, it, that's a commercial airliner, that's a helicopter. Uh, I'm very intrigued, there's something unusual there, and I hope to get to the bottom of it. Now, with footage in hand, Ted and Terrence are preparing to scrutinize several aspects of Bill and Pat's experiment. Even with an absolutely perfectly still, calm atmosphere, you're still gonna get this kind of unrelated random motion to these three points. Right. Now, of course, right. in this case, there was actual some kind of wind, and they're just all over the place. As Bill and Pat noted in the field, their balloons behaved erratically in the wind, in stark contrast to the 2004 footage. According to National Weather Service data, on the night of the experiment, winds are clocked at 12 miles per hour. In 2004, the winds are more than twice as strong at 30 miles per hour. Yet the lights do not exhibit the same erratic behavior as the flares and balloons. I mean, I could imagine a tether, like a nylon filament tether, right. but that would only limit the, the, the distance the this way, the, uh, but not this right. way. And we're seeing that they're not kind of bouncing in towards one another and hitting outer limits. They're locked 
What this seems to reinforce to the team is that the 2004 lights must be locked in place via some form of rigid structure. Without this, the light should exhibit the same volatile behavior as the experiment video. The longer it holds that right. uh, configuration, the stronger and stronger the case that they are actually yeah. locked. That's a pretty important conclusion. I think so. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not three independent uh, floating flares. But does this prove that the witnesses in Tinley Park and other locations around the world photographed a flying craft? Ted and Terence also want to contrast the color and light quality of the flares in comparison to the original footage. Unfortunately, it's, it's very hard to tell with these consumer grade cameras, uh, the exposure settings and the sensitivity is such that you can shoot uh, dramatically different colored lights mm -hmm. and uh, very often you're gonna see them basically bloom to almost solid white. The biggest difference uh, that's pretty clear to me is the, uh, the intensity differences. Right. The flickering basically, for lack of a better word, uh, is very evident in the flares. Ted and Terrence also look for scintillation, any fluctuation in the quality of the light. A constant light source will have less scintillation than a less stable source like the flares. To me, it's actually an illuminating source. Uh, it's very clear, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of light, right. uh, as opposed to some kind of burning uh, combustion. Right. Which will have its own uh, um, variability. Right. But Terence brings up another intriguing point of comparison. The experiment clearly shows the flares dropping residue, but in the original video from 2004, there is no evidence of any residue. I'd love to be able to say that our experiment and our analysis of the evidence leaves us with a very credible explanation. This was, was flares floating on balloons. Um, but I can't say that. I, I think uh, it's, it's extremely unlikely that, that that is the explanation for what we have here. I can say definitively that there's no way that I can see any kind of tethered balloon light source, flare or otherwise, um, would be responsible for the footage that we have. Without saying it's an alien spacecraft, I can definitively say, by the strictest definition, it is an unidentified flying object. The Tinley Park case is a really interesting case to me. We've got a lot of data. We have a lot of witness testimony. We were able to do some extremely quantitative scientific analysis of our, of our evidence. To the best of my ability, I, I can't put my finger on an explanation to say, oh, it was something terrestrial. All I can say is that I, I can't explain what it is, and, and yet is a highly credible, uh, corroborated case. So there's something there, and I can't explain what it is. And, and that is very intriguing to me. I believe we have a genuine anomalous aerial event that occurred over Tinley Park in 2004. Some people say it was a hoax, but we have no evidence that it was a hoax. Now I know in other UFO cases, pilots, both military and civilian, have come across these orbs of light, and that could be what we're dealing with here. So in my opinion, this case is still open. You have to ask yourself, are these people seeing the same object in the sky? Is this a worldwide UFO phenomenon? Or is this a worldwide UFO hoax? Both scientific and subjective testimony suggests that the object was not flares attached to weather balloons. Video analysis reveals something of massive size. Does the Tinley Park mass sighting and the mountain of visual evidence around it provide a glimpse of an actual UFO? Or are the answers still floating somewhere in the skies above Tinley Park? I've got a definite contact by 12 o'clock. Very bright yellow object. 4,000 feet above the ocean, a pilot and his passenger see two enormous yellow objects. There is no absolute explanation. The captain of another commercial jetliner watches an impossibly large disc fly under him and become invisible. The dimension was huge, absolutely huge. Now, 
pilots are coming forward to relive these incredible events. So we'll be flying really the exact position and, and direction. Mm, exactly the same route. And their colossal encounters are revealed on tape. I have no idea what it was. Stay away from 17,000. Are UFO sightings growing to epic proportions? This can turn out to be one of the most critical UFO sightings. This is case number 86206. Giant UFOs. It just flew right over me. April 23rd, 2007, approximately 3 p.m. A pilot for Oraini Airlines is flying a pedestrian route over the English Channel. In the distance, he suddenly sees a brilliant yellow light. He immediately radios his sighting into Jersey Air Traffic Control. He has just spotted something gigantic something he claims is almost a mile wide. These are actual radio communications between the cockpit and air traffic control. Uh, do you have any traffic by 12 o'clock level? No, no in traffic at all in your 12 o'clock. Roger, I've got a extremely bright yellow orange object straight ahead, a uh, very flat platform. We're looking at it through binoculars as we speak. After initially seeing nothing, Jersey Air Traffic Control then confirms the object on radar. They also receive visual confirmation from a second pilot on another airline. Soon after, a second enormous object is sighted by the original pilot. He says it is smaller than the first, but still thousands of feet across. Looking through binoculars I am now, uh, there's a second one just appeared behind the first one from where I am. Neither the pilot nor his air traffic controller are able to explain what these colossal objects are or where they came from. We're here in the UK, and these are not your everyday sightings. These are not little lights in the sky. What we have are descriptions of huge disc-shaped craft strange objects that these pilots have never seen before. I'm a pilot myself. I'm really interested to meet these pilots who are actually far more experienced than I am, who have seen something that they believe is a UFO. You've got huge objects that dominate the landscape around them, that overwhelm the planes they're flying, and you've got proximity. Pilots fly closer to these objects and see them closer than any other witness. With these sightings of massive UFOs reported by multiple pilots, the investigation is focusing on these high-caliber witnesses. Dr. Ted Ackworth will recreate the original O'Rainey flight over the English Channel with the pilot and his passengers. I can't wait to meet them, sit with them in the cockpits of their aircraft, and kind of get from their mouths their stories of what they saw. Pat Uskert will scrutinize the physical descriptions of these airborne giants with an atmospheric scientist. Uh, I want to get a complete description of the objects that eliminate atmospheric phenomena, balloons, or anything else that could be in the sky and make sure that we're talking about uh, legitimate UFOs. And Bill Burns will examine both the eyewitness testimony and the follow-up reports to these incredible incidents pilot activity is full of science. It's full of engineering. It's full of routine. You take all that science and you apply it to something so unusual that's never been before, now you have something you can investigate. Joining the team is documentary filmmaker James Fox, a researcher who was one of the first to speak with the O'Rainey Airlines pilot after his sighting in 2007. 
I met with Captain Ray Boyer about two months after his original sighting, and I think it's important for us to get up and recreate the flight path to get his perspective on what took place. Though encounters with giant UFOs are rare in comparison to most UFO sightings, they are not unheard of. In 2000, a British housewife in Bonsall claims to witness what some estimated to be a nearly three mile wide pink and white disc. In 1996, over a 134 mile stretch of highway in Canada's Yukon Territory, more than 30 witnesses confirmed seeing a saucer shaped object bigger than a football field. Triangulation data later revealed the object to be at least half a mile wide. And in 1986, the pilot of a Japanese Airlines flight traveling between Iceland and Anchorage, Alaska, reported three objects trailing his 747. Two of the objects were small, but the captain described the third as twice the size of an aircraft carrier. The giant object was tracked by ground and airborne radar. And the FAA logged over 60 minutes of data confirming the anomaly. Why do massive UFOs appear to be tracking our commercial aircraft? Captain Ray Boyer's encounter occurs on April 23rd, as he captains Oraini Airlines Flight 544 from Southampton to the island of Alderney, one of several small islands located in the channel. His audio transmissions from the flight show a pilot fully aware of his unusual situation. He attempts to get as much information about the objects as possible. Uh, 544 uh, negative. It's just a primary contact that we sometimes get anaprop on the radar. There is something possibly your left 10 o'clock at a range of three miles this time. I've got a definite contact by 12 o'clock. Very bright yellow object looking, well, like a cigar. His sighting expands to include a second massive object. And he is not the only one able to see something. Roger, 544, just confirming that all the passengers can see this aircraft. It's dead ahead, can't say how far, probably five miles, but it's down the same size. Uh, looks to be off the north, north, northwest coast of Albany. But the flight is short, and Boyer soon finds himself safely landing the aircraft on Alderney. Air traffic control on the nearby island of Jersey alerts several other pilots coming into the airspace about Boyer's sighting. If you could um, keep a good look out as you pass down the side of Alderney. We've cross-referenced this with traffic inbound to Jersey from the south, which saw the objects from the vicinity of Sark towards Alderney at the same level. I go from where I was coming all that, keeping a good look out, sir. Thank you. But when they arrive, they see nothing. The objects are gone. Once on the ground, Captain Boyer makes a few quick diagrams of what he sees and sends his logs to operations. The reaction to the event is thorough, and Bill and Pat are hoping that Boyer's immediate actions following the encounter might reveal more information. What made you come forward? Law, it's what you have to do. It's the British system. If you see an object or uh, other aircraft or that shouldn't be where it is, then you have to make a report. So this is a, a standard report that pilots have to fill out when they see a UFO, and they're encouraged to. It's not necessarily just for UFOs. It's for something unusual in controlled airspace. It could be another aircraft which shouldn't be there. Um, maybe it hasn't been picked up by radar. And if you see it, then you've got to report that. That's the rules. According to the United Kingdom Civil Aviation Authority, quote, a reportable occurrence in relation to aircraft means any incident which endangers or which, if not corrected, would endanger an aircraft, its occupants, or any other person. What is the standard reaction when a pilot sees something in airspace? In British airspace, all I can say is uh, it's just what's done. In American airspace, I understand that there's companies out there that don't want this sort of thing talked about, and I've heard that some pilots have been threatened that if they do talk about this sort of thing, they'll be fired. Though he isn't ridiculed or threatened, Boyer's account is met with little interest. 
the British government declares the incident unworthy of any follow-up investigation. The British military did not come back with any response immediately, although they did issue a few days later a statement stating that as the sighting wasn't of any threat to UK airspace, then they weren't going to investigate any further, and that perhaps the French might like to do that. The French came back with a response saying that if the British military were interested in operating some system over this matter, then they should do so, but neither have come back with anything. Alderney, Jersey, and the other surrounding islands are dependencies of the United Kingdom but are in close proximity to French airspace. Boyer finds it surprising that neither country is interested in the event, despite corroborating radar hits and the audio confirmation of a second pilot from Blue Island Airlines. Jersey Blair, the day three, two, the zone asked us to look if we could see an object which is being seen by A-Line at the moment. We've got something about eight o'clock resembling the description. Roger, on date 3 two. Roger, what range would you estimate that target? Around about the similar range to Alderney from us now. Have you talked to that pilot? Yeah, I've had a chat with him. Unfortunately, his company don't want him to come forward. He's also wanting to stay away from the limelight. Well, uh, what did he tell you? He saw it from about 20 miles away and uh, described the object pretty much similar to myself. This is probably one of the best, most corroborated, most credible UFO sightings we've ever encountered. And that's mainly because of the way Ray Bowyer took extra care to make sure his witnesses were with him in that sighting. The Blue Island pilot remains silent to this day, a key eyewitness, unwilling or unable to discuss what he saw. But other witnesses aboard Orani Flight 544 are willing to come forward to discuss the strange events they witnessed above the English Channel. They, along with Captain Boyer, are about to relive the same flight from April 23, 2007. And another sighting shows massive size isn't the only surprising characteristic of these craft. Become transparent and disappear, almost like it dematerialized. On April 23, 2007, an Orani Airlines pilot and his passengers claimed to see two giant yellow-orange objects during a routine flight over the English Channel. The pilot, Captain Ray Boyer, claims the objects are a mile wide and possibly larger. Ted and documentary filmmaker James Fox are prepping a flight aboard the same aircraft flying the identical route from 2007. He needed to follow a preconceived flight plan. He was in communication with air traffic control. He was flying under instrument flight rules. You really have to follow the procedure there. So would you just describe the parameters for the flight? Sure. Uh, it's a trial under aircraft, 18-seater. We'll be heading, uh, as you said, south-southwest, climbing initially to 2,000 feet. So we'll be flying really over the exact position and, and direction. Exactly the same route, same height, altitude, and very similar weather conditions today. Joining the journey are Kate and John Russell, two passengers aboard the April 23rd flight. They also witnessed the gigantic yellow-orange objects in the sky. The plane is a Britain Norman Trilander a small-range aircraft used primarily for short-distance flights. It is 49 feet, 3 inches long. The alleged UFOs are described as being over a mile long, more than 100 times the size of these aircraft. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, good, good visibility, very similar to what we have here today. At altitude, we're at 4,000 feet. I could see the object, the one object to start with, and then the second object, quite clearly, with the islands behind. And that was then when I got out of binoculars and, uh, and had a good look. 
And I can see this perfect shape of a, a pointed object, very brilliant yellow, with a dark area, two thirds from left to right, very clear. It was emitting light quite clearly. Both objects illuminating a fantastic amount of light. It was very brilliant and quite difficult to watch. Were you able to see both of them simultaneously? Not initially. Initially, just one object. And then uh, on descent, the second one became visual. Roughly how big? Do you have any idea? No, I'd say at least a mile across. Captain Boyer describes the two objects at a 15 to 1 ratio of length to height with a slightly elliptical appearance. The objects are also slightly tilted. Was the sun visible at the same time? The layer of cloud above was uh, still covering. The sun would have been great because there would have been a shadow on the sea. It also give us an exact position and a relative size, but there was no direct sunlight. That was a shame. But as the objects continue to remain in view, the passengers are alerted that something is happening. What about the passengers? Were they taking notice as well at this yeah. point? When I was looking out with binoculars, the chap sat behind me was saying, what is it? What's that? Because he could see it. The people behind couldn't see it so well because of the people sat in front. But there are a couple of passengers sat in row four, John and Kate Russell, and they could see it also. John and Kate Russell are frequent flyers on O'Reilly. They make this trip from Southampton to their home on Alderney often. But they've flown with Captain Boyer on numerous occasions and have never seen him react as he did that day. And Ray started sitting up in his seat and uh, looking out through the windscreen. Well, you know, when a pilot starts moving around, you begin to wonder what's going on. Then he got out his binoculars. And again, this is rather puzzling because he, he knows the way. Ray dipped the nose of the aircraft down. He'd been pointing out something to the person just behind him. So I looked out and I saw a bright light just about there and another beyond it, which was smaller. I thought the second light looked as if it could have been over the island. my wife was sitting where you are. She then drew my attention to what they were looking at. A couple of orange lights down below the aircraft were on the right-hand side. And I leapt over her, and at this point, there was only one light, a sort of orangey, yellow, almost like a football shape. But John and Kate quickly dismissed the idea that these lights are mere reflections. We're going south. The sun is the south of us. The sun reflects, yes, fine. But we're doing 120 knots. Therefore, the angle's changing all the time, and this light was constant. So you're saying it couldn't have been a reflection? No. No, it couldn't. If the sun's reflection had been responsible, the high speed of the aircraft would have eventually caused the light's appearance to change. But, according to John and Kate, this doesn't happen. They are able to see the objects for three to four minutes, and Captain Boyer has been observing them for 15. And as they get closer and closer, his concern is growing. When you saw these two objects, what were you thinking? Were you scared? These things were getting pretty hefty, pretty big, and I didn't want to go any closer with the passengers on board. These things were getting quite close now. But it was at that point, maybe, when we were still 20 odd miles away from them, that so I started to get somewhat trepidatious about the, the proximity. If they were moving, they were coming towards us, I didn't know. At that point, radar said they couldn't see anything, so, but I could see them, and they were big. If they decided to come quickly at me, it could have been scary, so we were just getting down and landing, that's what I was thinking at that point. The plane descends quickly, and Captain Boyer loses sight of the objects. He is able to land safely. Despite the extraordinary circumstances, the passengers give Captain Boyer the highest marks for his reaction to the situation. He's not a man 
man who gets ruffled. Anytime you knew you were flying with Ray, you felt you were in very safe hands. For him to register the concern that he had meant that what he was experiencing was very abnormal. Upon landing, Captain Boyer immediately asks for anyone who saw something unusual to leave their information. While the Russells do, some of the others don't want any further involvement. Or do you feel now that you saw something highly unusual? The more the time goes by, the more there is no absolute explanation. times, you know. It's extremely difficult trying to explain to people uh, what this is all about. And for me, it was so unusual that there's no precedent. I've seen nothing like it previously. I don't expect I'll see anything like it again. While nothing matching Captain Boyer or John and Kate Russell's description has been seen since, Another pilot's sighting of an alleged giant UFO in 1994 has striking similarities. The dimension was huge, absolutely huge. In April 2007, Captain Ray Boyer and several of his passengers aboard an O'Rainey Airlines flight see two objects hovering above the English Channel. The objects are estimated to be at least a mile wide. While sightings of this magnitude are rare, they have happened before. January 28, 1994. On Air France Flight 3532, Captain Jean-Charles Dubac is en route from Nice to London. His plane is near Paris, flying at 39,000 feet. The airspace here is typically crowded, but today it's going to have one more aircraft than usual. We are meeting with retired Air France Captain Jean-Charles Dubac, who's sighting in 1994 of an object over Paris was one of the most incredible stories in ufology. It was a very beautiful weather. We were approaching Paris, and uh, the steward who was in the cockpit said, uh, oh, a weather balloon. So it was the steward who first said there's a weather balloon there, yeah. and then the co-pilot yeah, yeah. who said there was something there, yeah, and yeah. that's what directed After your attention. I saw it, yes, it was on our left, and we, lo we, we look at this object during uh, one or two minutes. Though Captain Dubac's steward and co-pilot initially think they've spotted a rogue weather balloon, they quickly change their minds. The object is far too large. And it was at roughly the same altitude you were saying? That oh, it's were below us. It was below us. Below you? Below us. But how many feet below you? Oh, uh, 4,000 feet. We are 39. It was about 35,000 feet. And so it was really surprising. The dimension was huge, absolutely huge, because the, the, the distance was about 25 miles. And at 25 miles, you cannot see a plane. When did you realize it wasn't a plane? We all uh, immediately uh, identified this object as not a plane. It was different of a plane or a balloon or something. It was absolutely abnormal. As the object moves towards them, they come to a shocking realization. What they're looking at appears to be a huge flying disc. What's incredibly striking to me about Captain Dubok's sighting 
as a, he's a trained observer, being a pilot, and he was with two other people who witnessed this object. And it's apparently about a thousand feet across, disc shaped, uh, in broad daylight. And uh, that doesn't sound like a conventional aircraft to me. It was a uh, red ground with a uh, red color, very, very curious. And it was uh, some kind of haze. Captain Dubok describes the red brown disc as having a strange haze or fuzziness at its edges. And as he watches, he says it appears to be banking at a 45 degree angle. He estimates its size to be between 800 and 1,000 feet, or more than six times the size of his own jetliner. But what happens next is even more surprising. Uh, so after one minute, it became transparent and disappeared. So did it disappear quickly or gradually become transparent? Oh, it, it, it became uh, gradually transparent. It's like it dematerialized. When the object seems to disappear, Captain Dubois, his co-pilot, and his steward realize they are dealing with something extraordinary. Two of the most striking details to me are the huge size of that object. It wasn't the size of a plane, it was much larger. And then when the object seemed to dematerialize before his very eyes. What was the conversation in the cockpit of the plane about this? Yes, it was. What was it? It's impossible to create such a huge uh, ship and which able to disappear like that with such a fuzzy uh, characteristic, with this color, and with this appearance. We cannot do that. Captain Dubois radios in his sighting immediately to REMS Air Traffic Control in northern France. They confirm his sighting with radar from CODA, the operational center of air defense. Their radar registers a nearly one minute hit which crosses the path of Captain Dubok's Air France flight and then disappears. Despite the surprising detail, Captain Dubok remains silent for three years after his sighting. Neither his co-pilot nor his steward make a report. But in 1997, he finally comes forward with his story. Two years later, it becomes one of the top cases in the Cometa report a 1999 document put forth by an independent defense think tank and sent to the French government. The report uses well-documented sightings, such as Captain Dubox, to make the case that UFOs need to be treated seriously and as a matter of national security. Were you impressed by the conclusions of the Cometa report that these were military issues that had to be addressed? Yes. Yes, I was very impressed. I realized it was beyond all everything I could imagine. It was uh, really, really crazy. We cannot imagine the technology. And that's the message of the Commander Report itself, isn't it? Yes. The Commander Report basically just says that we can no longer ignore the extraterrestrial exactly. hypothesis. Exactly. The report concludes, quote, these studies demonstrate the almost certain physical reality of completely unknown flying objects they must be the subject of indispensable speculations and the development of prospective scenarios. So what you take away from a meeting with Captain Dubak are his impressions of the size of the object. This was clearly something not a plane. And Captain Dubak went on to research what we have to do to understand what UFOs are and why they're here. What are these giant objects being seen by pilots? Another recent sighting by two U.S. Air Force F-15s is captured on tape and raises an entirely new theory. I have no idea what it was, just say away from 17,000. Two pilots claim to have recent encounters with colossal-sized UFOs. Both accounts come from highly experienced pilots. Both are corroborated by radar and other witnesses. But now, a third sighting raises a new theory. Could these alleged giant UFOs be deploying smaller objects? 
the team heads to the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. We're meeting with British UFO researcher Philip Mantle to talk to him about a case that he's been investigating involving F-15s that were scrambled to uh, check out a UFO. January 12th, 2007. Just three months before Captain Boyer's sighting of two gigantic objects, two U.S. Air Force F-15s out of the Royal Air Force Base at Lakenheath are asked to intercept a target picked up on radar. But this object isn't a giant. Its size is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. These are the actual in-flight audio transmissions. Hi, right, dude, no kidding. I had a radar hit, there was something there. The sighting is investigated by Phil Mantle and other British UFO researchers at UFO Data Magazine. They receive the audio from aviation enthusiasts who pick up the transmissions on scanners. We know where it came from. We even know the call sign of the two aircraft that were involved. We know the date uh, where the incident took place. We've had it independently verified by the Ministry of Defense. It is the genuine article. Phil and his partners received this official response from the Ministry of Defense. Quote, I understand that two USAF aircraft spotted an object on their onboard radar, but the MOD does not investigate or seek to provide a precise explanation for each of the 200 to 300 UFO reports we receive every year. Well, they're not denying it occurred. They're just saying that as far as they're concerned, there's an explanation for it. It was something to do with a weather balloon. To follow up on this theory, Phil and his colleagues contact the Met Office, the UK's National Meteorological Service. They inquire about the possibility of a weather balloon in the area of the North Sea where the Air Force's F-15s were flying. They are told there were none in the area. For now, with the MOD dismissing the event as a weather balloon and the pilots remaining anonymous, the audio transmissions are the only evidence. So gentlemen, this is really exciting. This is the actual live recording of the interaction between two F-15 pilots and an object. I had a radar hit and there was something there. It looked like a, uh, it didn't look like a bird. It looked like no kidding, a rock to me. First is a radar return. And he says, it looks like a rock to me. I have no idea what it was, but uh, basically just heads up, try to stay away from 17,000. I have no idea what it was. I'm going to use my radar to see if I can pick this object up again. I picked it up twice. And so obviously, what are we getting? It is unknown. It's unidentified. Visually, the pilots can't make out what it is. Most close sightings of UFOs described objects at least the size of common man-made aircraft and the objects seen recently by pilots have been enormous. But this object is incredibly small, described as a rock. Yet, according to the pilot's descriptions, it seems to be under intelligent control. It just flew right over me. From the object appears stationary. But it went from 17, the first time I saw it, to 17.7, so it's not falling. The object now appears to be inexplicably rising. So not only is it an object they can't identify, it's an object, Phil, it's doing maneuvers, it sounds like, and they can't identify what the maneuvers are. Uh, uh, exactly. But what's really amazing is how calm these pilots are. They're, they're not excited, they're just saying what, what they're seeing. I want to try to look at it and then you follow it behind me if you can. I've got it uh, 17,000 feet, eight miles off my nose, 2.5 miles off my nose right now, 17,000 feet. I have visual now. I'm going to fly underneath you. His uh, wingman is behind him at this point, so he can't slow down. He's dropping down 2,000 feet to get under it. 
Yeah, I, I got some uh, actual uh, goosebumps there when he's talking about merging. You could just imagine these planes going so fast, and here comes this strange rock-shaped object that they're looking at. That's two pilots, two radar lock-ons, two uh, guys saying that they don't know what this thing is. After one last pass, the two pilots lose sight of the object. I don't want to circle back around. Well, hopefully we'll be able to see it. See, did you see anything? No other evidence of the event has emerged since, and many of Phil's Freedom of Information Act requests are still outstanding. Interesting to see how the MOD has shrugged this thing off, saying, well, we don't investigate UFOs that don't constitute a threat. Guess what? Here's an object over secure airspace. This tape can turn out to be one of the most critical UFO sightings in all of British ufology. And the F-15 account has striking similarities to another important pilot encounter. In the 1986 Japanese airline sighting, the pilot referred to two smaller objects that accompanied a third gigantic UFO. He referred to the largest object as a, quote, mothership and theorized that the two smaller objects were ships sent from it in the same way that aircraft carriers are used by the military. Could it be that smaller UFOs, like the one witnessed by the F-15 pilots, are coming from larger ships, such as those seen by Ray Boyer and Jean-Charles Dubac? With these new types of sightings come theories on both sides of the UFO debate. Could bizarre weather phenomena be responsible? Or does the evidence suggest something else? For two pilots to see a mirage or a reflection of the same image is very unlikely. Sightings of alleged giant UFOs have perplexed pilots and witnesses who have seen these colossal objects but some scientists believe atmospheric conditions could be the missing explanation. Ted and Pat head to the University of Manchester to get this developing theory. We're about to meet with Dr. Grant Allen, who's an expert in atmospheric science. We're gonna have a look at a number of possible explanations for our case. There are lots of different atmospheric phenomena that could be mistaken for UFOs. I mean, there are many tricks that the atmosphere can play with. One of these phenomena are lenticular clouds. These clouds have the appearance of lenses or disks, one of the most common shapes of reported UFOs. Lenticular clouds are a special type of clouds. They're actually stationary. They don't move like most other clouds you might see in the sky. They, they appear to be stationary, and they're also very smooth. The clouds form when strong winds come over high ground, such as a hill or mountain. As the air is lifted, the water it carries condenses and forms a cloud with a smooth top and smooth edges. Their appearance is typically quite large and can stretch over several miles. And they can appear to be very strange when compared to the cloud surrounding them. So to form a lenticular cloud, wouldn't you need some sort of topographic formation to move the, the air up into the atmosphere like that? Yeah, you need a very significant hill or, or mountain and crucially as well, very strong wind speeds. So is that likely to happen over the English Channel? Well, you get strong wind speeds. There aren't many islands, so you wouldn't expect to see many lenticular clouds in the channel. Not only is the English Channel an unlikely location for these types of clouds, they are also almost exclusively found at high altitudes of 20 to 40,000 feet. Ray Boyer's sighting was only at 4,000 feet, and Charles Dubois' sighting near Paris, though at the correct altitude range, describes a tilting object. Lenticular clouds have little to no movement in the sky, and these types of clouds are never detected by radar. What about sun dogs? Uh, sun dogs are a, a phenomenon related to ice crystals in the atmosphere. Uh, whenever the, the sun is low on the horizon, sort of at sunset, ice crystals in the atmosphere on the horizon can bend sunlight. Now this has the effect of forming patches of light either side of the sun. 
though bearing no resemblance to Captain Dubok's reddish-brown disc. Could bright yellow sun dogs be what Captain Boyer saw over the English Channel? Sun dogs typically appear in pairs and have the same bright yellow-orange characteristic of Boyer's objects. But sun dogs mostly appear at sunrise or at sunset on the horizon. Ray Boyer's encounter occurs at 3 p.m. Sun dogs actually are fairly rare, and they, they look quite striking when you see them in the atmosphere because they're quite unusual. Most people would realize it's a patch of light and not a solid object. But Dr. Allen has his own theory on the Ray Boyer sighting. Having looked at some data for the area, there is evidence for a very strong temperature inversion in the atmosphere. Temperature typically decreases with height in the atmosphere. An inversion occurs when the temperature increases with height. When this happens, the inversion layer can act as a mirror, reflecting or even sometimes bending light along the atmosphere. The inversion could not only create bright objects like Captain Boyer describes, but false hits on radar known as anomalous propagation. What about these brown or gray bands that Captain Boyer describes? Well, that could be explained by an object in the path of the rays of light. So if there was a very small cloud in the path that the light has taken, then it would appear as a shadow on that uh, object. But the idea of a temperature inversion may be put to rest by a recently issued analysis from several atmospheric researchers who published a thorough report on Captain Boyer's sighting in 2008. According to the research into the event, quote, the triangulated apparent location of UAP number one near Alderney was intersected by the reciprocal sight line from Captain Patterson to an unusual yellow object at a similar height in a similar location. What this means is that if Captain Boyer was seeing a reflection or other optical illusion from his sight line, it would be highly unlikely for the second pilot to see the same reflection illusion in the exact same place. I think for two pilots in two completely different locations, to see a mirage or a reflection of the same image so is very unlikely. Does that uh, influence your opinion of your answer at all? I think this is the most likely of a list of unlikely explanations. Science continues to struggle with answers for the objects that these pilots are seeing. And witnesses remain resolved. These giant objects are not illusions. People say they can't believe in UFOs, but here I don't think it's a matter of, of belief anymore. I mean, we've, we've investigated the cases, we have audio evidence, we've talked to the pilots, we've got corroborating witnesses. It seems like uh, regardless of what people believe, pilots are seeing UFOs. If you think about these cases, the amount of air traffic is only increasing. I can only think over the course of the coming years, we're going to see more and more of these kinds of reports. I think the reports will only proliferate. And we have a lot now, we're going to have even more in the future. In most investigations, sightings usually occur from the ground from far away. This is a whole new level of UFO encounter. As sightings of UFOs continue to increase, are they getting closer and larger? Or are we finally getting the best glimpses of what's been in our skies all along?